Okay, I think we've got a fair few numbers uh, in the session now. We have a, a really tight, packed agenda. So we are just going to go crack on and, and, and hopefully if there's more people joining, they will catch up as we go. Um, so welcome to our event, uh, Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is, Investing in Sustainable Regional Food Systems and Community to Public Procurement. We're really happy that so many people have been able to join us here today. Uh, my name is Catherine Pendrich. I am a Partnerships Manager with the Food for Life Scotland programme, and we are co-hosting today's event with the Sustainable Food Places programme. And I am going to hand over to Simon for Nourish from Nourish for a bit more of an introduction in just a second. I'm just going to run through some really quick housekeeping just to kick off the call. Um, so just please do remember to keep on mute throughout the session. We've got quite a large number of people who are joining today and it just runs a lot smoother um, if people stay on mute. Um, but we would love for you to engage with the event through the chat function. So please introduce yourself there post any comments or questions there um, and I will be monitoring the chat throughout the event and we will have time for Q&A after each of the sessions. We'd also love it if you wanted to engage with the event on social. Um, our Twitter tags are on the slide on screen at the moment at Soil Assault Scott and at Food Places UK. If you want to tweet about the event, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you should also um, be able to select speaker view on your Zoom um, just in the top right hand corner. If you want to toggle to speaker view, that will make sure that you're seeing um, the speaker at all times. You should hopefully all have downloaded the most recent version of Zoom to make sure that everything goes smoothly for you today. Hopefully you saw that reminder in the event right. Um, and finally, please do note that today's session is being recorded. So if you don't fancy being on the recording, just make sure that you have your camera turned off. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Simon Kenton Lake from Nourish Scotland. And he's going to give a further introduction to the event and talk about why public procurement is so important in building regional food systems and communities. So over to you, Simon. Brilliant, thanks, Catherine. Um, good morning, everybody. Fantastic to see how many people have turned up today. We've had 255 registered for the event, so um, that's wonderful. We've obviously hit a hot topic. So um, I work for Nourish Scotland. I'm a senior project officer there. And Nourish Scotland's an NGO working on food policy and practice, mostly in Scotland, but also in other parts of the world with our global partners. So part of my role there is to support the development of the Sustainable Food Places Network in Scotland. Those who don't know about the Sustainable Food Places Network, it's a network of 60 around 60 plus food partnerships that takes a system-based approach to working with organizations from across the food environment to ensure that we have a food system that is good for both people and for the planet. And one of the interesting things about the Sustainable Food Places membership is that you must have the proactive engagement of your local authority. And so considering food procurement is one of the key areas that we work in, local authority buying is absolutely crucial for moving that forward. So here in Scotland, we've got 13 food partnerships that are members of the Sustainable Food Places Network. And we're also working with many other local authorities to develop their own partnership. If anyone's interested in finding out more about the work that we do or finding out about how to set up a food partnership in your own local authority area, do get in touch after the event. OK, so when I was thinking about public procurement and I was talking to my friends about it or people that don't work in the food sector, generally speaking, what happens is either their eyes glaze over or they say, ah, that's just shopping, right? Well, I guess it is just shopping, but when you think that Scottish government estimates they spend around 150 million pounds per annum on public food and drink, and that's not even a definitive figure. I'm not quite sure whether that's you know, a lot more now or how that's cut across things like schools, prison service, care homes, etc. Whatever the true figure and however that's split, that's an awful lot of shopping. Of course, public procurement is more than just about buying ingredients or putting a meal on a plate. It impacts our whole society, from the way they use our land, our seas, and support our local economies, to how we nourish those that need it most and our ability to achieve our climate change commitments. In short, public procurement is a part of an integrated food system where everything is connected. So for us, it's about how and where food is grown and by whom, how it gets from the farm to the kitchens, but it's also about how it's prepared, how nutritious it is, and how tasty and how appetizing it looks on our plates. 
And importantly, it's about the role that food plays in the lives of the people that eat it. So I wanted to start with a bit of a policy context. And while this isn't a political event, we do recognize there's local elections coming up and it will be the newly elected members that set the direction of travel, but it's also the local authority officers that will have to deliver on this work. That said, policy context in Scotland has never been more conducive to rethinking how we do public procurement. So we've got the Good Food Nation Bill, that's making its way through stage one of the parliamentary process, and we're expecting that report any day now. The resulting bill is likely for the very first time to pace the statutory duty on public bodies to create food plans and to have regard to them when carrying out their work. Public procurement is one of the primary mechanisms through which the public sector can impact food and therefore must be at heart of these food plans. The Scottish Government has also recently consulted on its local food strategy. The consultation document emphasised the buying power of public sector procurement as one of the three main elements of the growth strategy. We also know there's an intention to bring forward a community wealth building bill. We're not quite sure what's going to be in that, but we do know that public procurement is one of the main pillars of the community wealth building approach. And therefore, this bill must also touch on this area. And finally, the transition away from the common agricultural policy will prove key in ensuring that we grow more of what we eat and eat more of what we grow in Scotland. How we reallocate finances from the cap provides an opportunity to, to rethink the vital role that local authorities are going to have in delivering future national and local food plans. Local authorities must be adequately resourced to play this key crucial role. So in short, food procurement will be a key policy leader going forward. Okay, so before I talk about what we are going to cover today, I just wanted to talk about a few things that we're not going to cover, or at least not in much detail. So we've already mentioned community wealth building. The, the use of the public purse as a tool for public goods should be self-evident, and that really runs through it as a thread through everything we're talking about today. That said, there's already an awful lot of workshops and an awful lot of events that have already happened and are going to happen in the future talking about community wealth building in more detail. If you want to get a better, better understanding of that, then I think we're going to put into the chat now a link to a recent Sustain and Sustainable Food Places UK event that, that talked about it in much more detail. So I'd encourage you to watch that. Two other areas we're not going to talk about. Firstly, processing. So we hear time and time again that one of the limiting factors to getting more local food on our plates is a lack of adequate processing facilities. There's an urgent need for local abattoirs, mobile vets, dairy facilities, dirty kitchens to prepare veg, or even just kitchens themselves. Equally, we're not going to talk too much about workers' rights. But as Brexit and COVID have taught us, the people in our food system really are the glue that holds it together. Food should nourish those that grow, pick, transport, prepare, cook, serve, and dispose of our food waste just as much as those that eat. Both these topics deserve sessions of their own right. And what we'll be doing after this, sending around a bit of a feedback um, opportunity where if there are particular topics that you think we should be covering in future, we'd be very, very welcome to, to speak to you about that and partner with you or support you in that. So now on to what we're gonna to cover today. When we want to source sustainably and seasonally, whilst also supporting our local economies and communities, the processes around how we purchase food are incredibly important. There is lots of innovation around progressive purchasing systems, and we'll be exploring some examples of these today. So first of all, Laura Muir from Scotland Excel will look at the work being done in mainstream procurement to encourage more local producers and diversify our supply chain. Following Laura, Chrissy Storry from the Dynamic Food Advisory Board will talk about dynamic purchasing, and how this can help shorten supply chains and embrace seasonality. In the last part of the session, Alan Mawson from Dumfries and Galloway Council will give you a tour around Naturally D&G. Now, this is a regional food hub that prides itself on using local produce and not only provides food for all the schools in Dumfries and Galloway, but also has external catering facilities. However, the role of public procurement doesn't stop there. In our public establishments, we need to stop seeing mealtimes as just an inconvenient break in the day and recognize the vital role that food has. The role it has in helping pupils achieve their potential, in supporting the mental health of those in our care services, in the rehabilitation of our prisoners, but also in aiding those in hospitals to recover quicker and better. So using the rollout of universal free school meals, Chris Ross, Vice Chair of Assist FM and City of Edward Council, will explore the case for good school food. And we think the examples and arguments that he poses there are equally valid to any of our other public establishments. At the same time, Tilly Robinson Miles from Eat Well, Age Well will be digging a bit deeper into the role of food in our health and well-being, looking at how ultimately 
which comes down to how much we value food in our society. So these two sessions are going to be running at the same time in parallel after the break. So we'll let you know how to choose which of these sessions to go to just near the time. We'll also be recording this, this whole event, splicing it together, and it will be shown on the Soul Association YouTube channel afterwards, which we'll share. So you don't worry about missing out too much. OK, then, so in our final session, we want to look at the crucial role that food procurement has in addressing our climate and nature emergencies. Whilst we understand the benefits that shortening supply chains can have in supporting our local economies and communities, if we want to really utilise the power of food procurement, then we need to do more than just buy local. So Andrew Stark from RSBB Scotland and Ilva Hagland from Zero West Scotland will be looking at what we should really talk about and what we really mean when we say sustainability in relation to food procurement. Okay, so just briefly before we go on to our next speaker, I'd like to return to the Good Food Nation Bill, which is, of course, the real opportunity to put our money where our mouth is by enshrining the right to food in Scots law. Public procurement must lead the way in ensuring that the most vulnerable and those in our care can access healthy, sustainable and tasty food, no matter who you are, where you were born or how much money you have. Okay, so we hope that's set the scene for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the morning. So now I'm going to hear from our first speaker. So I'd like to introduce Lucy Wardle, who is Food for Life Scotland's Supply Chain Officer. She's going to reflect on some of the work she's been doing in partnership with Scottish local authorities to facilitate local supply and highlight the opportunity that exists for local authorities who are not currently working with Food for Life. So without further ado, I hand over to, to Lucy. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Simon. I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully if you can just, someone can let me know if that is full screen. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's really great to see so many of you here today. And um, so it's, it's really exciting um, to be able to share this kind of platform with, with all of these other speakers. But also I'm aware seeing who's uh, attending that actually there's a lot of expertise as well in the virtual room. So, I'm going to really quickly run through um, the Food for Life programme and how we do work um, across Scotland to really localise um, the food that is served in meals. Um, but afterwards, we're going to have a good chunk of time to do some um, questions. But also, I'd really encourage discussion and, you know, anyone else uh, who's here today can um, share some of their experiences as well. So just quickly, what is Food for Life served here? Because um, this is the, the mechanism that I'll be using to talk about the things that we do um, to localise school meals. Um, so Food for Life served here, it's a programme that's run by Soil Association Scotland and we are fully funded by the Scottish Government. Um, and we've been around in Scotland since about 2008. So it's been quite um, a while now um, that we've been doing this work in Scotland. And we support local authorities to get more food on the table, uh, more local food, and to serve fresh, healthy, and sustainable meals in their schools. So we certify this through a range of standards, which I will not delve into too much. There's a lot more information on our website if you're interested. But we um, certify this at three levels, bronze, silver, and gold, um, with an independent assessment every year. So the, the real aim of the scheme is to encourage and reward caterers who are serving fresh food, sourcing more environmentally sustainable and ethical food, so more organic food, higher welfare like free range and farm assured, also making healthy eating easier for the children and um, championing local food producers, which is what I will be focusing on today. So this is a uh, a little map of where we are in Scotland. So we are currently, we have 18 local authorities who help hold the award, the Food for Life Served Here Award, and we work with many more. We have new local authorities joining all the time, and I know quite a lot of them are here today. Um, so that is a huge impact across the, the sector in Scotland. We're, we're talking 26 and a half million meals every year being served that are certified Food for Life. So it's, it's a really big impact and it can make a huge change. A little bit about the team that we have. Um, so we have a very dedicated team. We're based um, in Edinburgh um, and we have partnerships managers, menu and catering skills officers, communication support, data and analysis and evaluation support, which is really um, important, and the supply chain development, which is what I do. Um, and we have this huge focus on Scottish sourcing. 
which is all about you know community wealth building and investing that public money back into public good so it's really thinking about the the public money that's spent on food and public procurement being an investment into our local communities and that's really where the supply chain work comes in so a little bit more about local supply chains why we should bother why why should we focus on local suppliers and there are so many reasons, and I think a lot of the speakers here today are gonna to cover lots of different aspects. But obviously um, we're investing in that local community, but it's a really important way to reconnect people with where their food comes from and how it's produced. And of course, in school meals, children growing up, it's so important to show them actually what is available in their local area and, and how they can eat seasonally and fresh local food. So we're supporting those local businesses and providing a valuable route to market for them, and but also encouraging shorter supply chains, um, which is really important. We've, we've seen through COVID, through Brexit, and lots of other kind of events that long and complex supply chains are incredibly fragile. And we, we did a, a lot of work at the beginning of um, the pandemic to look at local authorities and the supplies that they were using. And what we heard was that the more local, smaller suppliers were much quicker to pivot and be able to support their local authorities. So that was an example of, of how these shorter supply chains can actually offer a lot more resilience. Um, and of course, you know, the community wealth building aspect, we're creating jobs and training opportunities in our local area, um, protecting the skills, farming and production, which are so important and protecting that for the next generation. Um, a study that we did at Food for Life a few years ago showed that every one pound that was spent through the program, through local suppliers, was generating a social return on investment of four pounds to one. So that's all of that extra benefit going back into the local authority area, which is so important. So how do we do this and how do we at Food for Life work across the supply chain? So lots of different ways. Um, we really uh, work hard to support local authorities. So that's often identifying opportunities for them to source more Scottish food um, and in, in, uh, increasing higher welfare products and so looking at how we can support some SMEs and more Scottish businesses. Uh, so we do a lot of work to facilitate supply chain pilot projects. Um, we also troubleshoot and help problem solve um, with any kind of supply chain related issues for our local authorities who are on the Food for Life programmes so that can include working with their suppliers and reformulating products to meet their requirements. And also really importantly, we celebrate success stories with local producers and Scottish sourcing. So we love to make a big fuss when um, these things work out and we have a great um, story to tell everyone about the great work that's happening through food in local authorities. And then suppliers, we work really hard to try and tell suppliers about the fantastic route to market that is on offer through local authorities. So we link them up with councils and we help to facilitate these opportunities. Um, and you know, through that, we use data analysis. We can help advise on volumes and demand that's needed uh, and really try and kind of bridge that gap between the supplier and the local authority and hopefully take some of the work out of it for the local authority. Um, but developing new markets for Scottish suppliers is really important. And so we try to drive that demand for local um, food. And also signposting to other support available, like we have the supply development program, which is valuable, and highlight contract opportunities with the local authorities or framework opportunities from Scotland Excel. And then we also work with industry stakeholders. A couple of them are also speaking today. Um, so I mentioned Scotland Excel, and we, we work with lots of different industry stakeholders to really collaborate to support local authorities but also to really raise the profile of the public sector as a valuable route to market. And I think we still have a lot more work to do there, but you know, every little help. So we're really trying to, um, we're really trying to work together to talk about how great the opportunity is for local authorities and local food. So if you're a local authority, um, how to work with local suppliers? It's a good question. Um, and, you know, we know procurement, it can be very hard and, and complicated, but there's a couple of different ways that we work. Um, you know, and we always say there's 32 versions of everything. We work on a case by case basis because it's really about kind of the needs and requirements and what's available. Um, 
So if, if the value is below a tendering threshold, the uh, you know, local authorities can often work on an individual arrangement, which has worked really well in the past, and we have some examples of that. Or it could be something you know, as simple as choosing more Scottish op options with, with existing suppliers and frameworks. So having a look at what you're buying already and seeing if there's any opportunities with your existing suppliers to just choose more Scottish products or more local products. Um, we also work to link in local growers and producers with existing suppliers and wholesalers. So if they already hold the contract, that takes a lot of work out of it. Um, but there's also local contracts um, and the Scotland Excel frameworks. A lot of the um, projects that we work on are pilot projects because they start out, you know, it's an experiment. We're trying to investigate, look at the barriers and see what can work. So it's really um, important to kind of approach these projects in that way. But it could be something that's hyper local. And I'm going to talk about an example of that in a minute. It could be one product, one supplier, one school. It could be five schools, a geographical area or an entire local authority. So there's lots of different options. Um, and yeah, the, the opportunities are endless, really. So on to some real life examples of projects that are happening. So this one is the hyperlocal example that I was telling you about, Woodside Arran. It's a croft on the island um, of Arran. And this initial idea came from the supplier. They came to us and said, we would really love to supply our, our local um, community. They were already really connected in with the community that they wanted to supply through the stores. Um, so we worked with them and North Ayrshire Council, <clears throat> who were really passionate about this as well. And now we've, we've moved on. They're supplying the, all the primary schools, the high school and a care home on the island. They've managed to grow their business um, and they're using a community supported agriculture approach, um, really focused on sustainability. And so since starting this, they've, they've hired more local staff. They've attracted a lot of attention as a, as a great example and they were featured in North Ayrshire's community wealth building strategy, because this is a wonderful example of community wealth building in practice. Another example here with East Ayrshire and Mosgiel Milk. So this um, came to fruition last year and it started with Bryce, the farmer there, coming to us a couple of years ago and saying that he would really love to supply his organic milk into the local schools in East Ayrshire. And his business model was a little bit different. He had a plastic free supply chain um, so it involved using individual vending machines in dining halls. So this went through a slightly different route. Um, he tendered for a contract with East Ayrshire Council, a local contract, and won that contract and is now supplying into um, all of the primary schools in East Ayrshire. He uses organic farming, so he's you know, really protecting the environment and also reducing emissions through lots of different on his farm but this came from the local authority really seeing the value in this local supplier and all of the other benefits that he offered um, along with his milk supply. And my last example is a local authority who actually used the, their existing supplier and just looked for more Scottish products. So when um, West Lothian came onto the program they, uh, one of our standards is around animal welfare. So you have to serve meat that is um, UK animal welfare assured. Um, so by doing that, they chose some, um, some UK products. And obviously we're in Scotland, we have lots of Scottish red meat. Um, so they were focusing on Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, and specially selected pork. So within that first year of joining Food Life, uh, their, their fresh butcher meat rose to 95% Scottish, which is amazing, and they did that through their existing suppliers. So that was a real whistle-stop tour. Um, I hope it wasn't too fast um, for you, but if anyone wants to get in touch with me after this, that's my email address. We have a lot more information on our website um, and a lot of case studies as well. So yeah, get in touch. Um, and even if it's just a conversation, an idea that you want to discuss, you know, the, the door is always open. So I will stop sharing now and thank you so much, Lucy. Some questions? Yeah, um, there is no questions coming through in the chat. So I was just going to invite anyone, if you feel more comfortable raising your hand and, and turning on your video and asking a question. If, if not, I have I have some questions I could ask. <laughs> um, oh, there's just one come through from Simon. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, Barbara, I'll, I'll let you come in first because you. Turn your camera on. On you go, Barbara. 
All right. Thank you very much. I was just busy typing, but um, not quickly enough. So, um, Lucy, that's absolutely fab. I'm I'm fairly new to all this, so I'm really. Um, it's great to hear what's going on and the, the good work behind the scenes. And, you know, this is so important. So thank you very much for that great presentation, everything that's been done, everything that's going to be done. Um, my question is um, re really, I know that you're um, the, the Soil Association is a member of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture. And I'm wondering whether you have any associations for products that aren't available in Scotland, so bananas, oranges, things that we can't grow with the fair trade movement, you know, because this would be really extending what we're doing here mm -hmm. in exactly the same way, but globally and having such an important global impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the organic side, the organic certification side of Soil Association um, is separate to the charity side of the organisation, which is where we sit as Food for Life. So we do definitely encourage organic food in public procurement, but obviously we recognise the price difference and there's a lot of pressures on budget and it's not always possible. Um, but our, our standards, the Food for Life Served Here standards, do encourage organic at um, silver and gold level. And you're right, you know, we do have to look at products that are not um, local. Um, and sometimes there is a bit of a challenge between looking at local and organic. But when it comes to things like bananas, obviously they're not going to be local. Um, so yeah, local authorities do buy organic bananas and also non-organic bananas, and none of which are from <laughs> Scotland. But we would say wherever you can buy local, then you should be. Um, if you if you know if that's available to you so it's really looking at developing supply chains and looking at the products that we can produce in Scotland and that we can manage to do organically like um, you know like the example of dairy so I don't know if that answered your question um, yeah. but if it was a sorry go on well it was just specifically um, because of all, all the things you said about um, uh, the social uh, what do you call it a uh, social premium basically um okay. you know this ties so much into the fair trade um movement and fair trade is essentially either organic or as low um impact on you know chemicals and use of chemicals and safe labor practices as possible so i was really you know it's like a step to another step to the side from organic so i i just wondered whether uh, particularly because of public procurement in schools and things, you know, it's so, so much part of that educational part that um, people are supporting um, everybody else in the rest of the world with what they eat as well. And, you know, it just ties in with everything that everybody said so far, really, about um, quality and quality of life that goes with it and value in our food and value in the people who produce it. So I just wanted to throw that in. I don't want to hijack, so I'll shut up now, but thank you. No, that's really valuable. Thank you for adding that. Um, I should maybe just point out very quickly, we do reward fair trade sourcing uh, with points at our, our silver and gold level. So the served here standards do recognise the, the contribution of, of fair trade sourcing as well. Um, but Simon, did you want to come in quickly with a question? Um, I can do, yes. It, it was just interesting. I was um, recently in, in Dumfries and Galloway visiting Natural DNG, so it's really great to, to have Alan on the call. And we were also joined by one of the local, well, local farmers, a dairy farmer, also has uh, the producer's meat, and was sort of saying, well, it's really tricky because we're trying to, to, to have Scottish produce and we're trying to look after the land. It, and yet when I go somewhere like to bookers or when I go and see talk to butchers there, the, the price of the beef that's coming over from Australia is so much cheaper that it's really impossible for me to do it and, and do it at a price point that's actually going to be interesting for people. I'm just wondering, and maybe this is a, a question for lots of people here today, is you know what what what's what's our plan here? You know, how do we do this? And without whilst also respecting the fact that we need to be paying farmers fairly and we need to be paying them to look at stewards of our land, animal welfare and all of this. And, and I don't think you have the answer, or maybe you do have the answer, Lisa, but it was just something that came up over this last week. Yeah, well, I mean, I can add from the Food for Life served here perspective that one of the standards is that all the meat that local authorities serve um, satisfies UK animal welfare. So even though I know Australia do have um, similar welfare standards, 
it, it wouldn't be UK farm assured. So actually it, it wouldn't be compliant with, with food for life. Um, so that would be, um, yeah, that would be one way that local authorities that we work with and hold the award would only be supplying um, UK meat. And in Scotland, a lot of the, you know, the red meat is, um, is one of the things we can do here. So that's, that's really an easy win for local authorities that they find and um, that they can get supplied. But I do agree with you, it's, it's a real pressure because everyone is pressured on their price. And actually, if they do have a choice to get a, a cheaper product, but I guess the thing is, we really need to think about why is it cheap and where's the hidden cost? And even if it's to the detriment of the environment in Australia, it's still going to affect us um, and the whole globe. So I think it's it's just so important when we're thinking about all of the food that's on the plate and that we're using public money on, think about the, the added values. And if it's cheap, why is it cheap? Um, and it goes back to, you know, what, we, what Barbara said about really valuing food and our farmers and everyone that's involved in the supply chain. Thanks Lucy. I think we've maybe got time for one more very quick question because there's a really interesting one in the chat. Um, Mads Fisher Mahler has um, asked about actually the, the reasons behind valuing local and, and what that brings to procurement and I think later on in the event we're going to have a discussion about that sphere beyond local about the importance of sustainability that is going beyond just local and food miles but maybe you could comment on kind of why at Food for Life we really think local food is important as well as, as sustainable and organic food. Mm -hmm. Yeah definitely and it's a really good question um, but everything that I you know said about community wealth building and really looking at what's happening in our local authorities and how they can use that public money to spend in their local area that is going to build more jobs, more training opportunities. And, you know, why invest that money somewhere else if you can invest it in your own area? But it's, I do agree that, you know, as Kathy says, we're going to talk later about, it's not just about food miles. And we know that local doesn't always equal sustainable. And that's very true. But we have to think about all of the other benefits that come from a shorter, more direct supply chain and um, looking at what's on our doorstep rather than, you know, what's further away. But um, I'm just reading the, is it a way to tap into political support? I mean, it's a good, we are funded by the Scottish government. The Scottish government are very passionate about local um, supply, which is why we do what we do, um, because they really see the benefit in investing in our farmers and our, in our food producers. So that's, that's true. Um, but I, I think, you know, it is important for children in the, in the schools growing up to see where their food is coming from. And we do encourage local authorities to really tell stories around the provenance of the food on the plate, because we want them to know that, yes, you know, it is grown in their local area down the road from a field. It's not just come from the supermarket. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that's not always focused you know on the educational curriculum but it's something that we can add through the food that we serve on the plate. Thanks so much Lucy um, this is such an interesting topic and there's so many questions in the chat and um, they were slow to come and then they all came in so I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have time for all of them but we're probably going to have to crack on and, and maybe we can come back to some of these questions um, in, in the later Q&A sessions. Um, but thank you so much, Lucy. We are now going to move on to a session that we have uh, termed progressive purchasing systems. And we are going to hear from three different speakers bringing a, a different perspective on that topic. We're going to hear from each of the speakers and then we're going to have a joint Q&A session with the time that we have left. So we are going to start off with Laura Muir from Scotland XL. So Laura, if you are ready, I'll just hand over to you. I'm guessing you're just sharing your slides, but just so you know, you are on mute, just in case. Got there in the end. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Muir and I am a category manager at Scotland Excel. 
Um, I look after the corporate and education team, um, but until very recently, I was contract owner for our food frameworks. And um, for those of you that have heard me before, you'll know they're very much still my baby. Um, so just a quick whistle stop tour on Scotland XL. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, Scotland XL are the sensitive procurement expertise for the local government sector. We are a leading non-profit shared service, which is funded by Scotland's 32 local authorities. Scotland XL is governed by a joint committee of elected members from all local authority partners, and that's responsible for the strategic direction of the organisation, as well as approving the annual budget and our business plan. We've got a subgroup of this body, the Executive Subcommittee, and they meet regularly to approve our contract awards and our other key business decisions. Our services are designed to help councils um, to meet the twin challenges of reducing budgets at a time of growing demand. Collaborative procurement increases efficiency and it ensures money is saved to protect frontline services. And by working together through Scotland XL, our councils can realise a host of social, economic and environmental benefits from their spend. Our £2 billion contract portfolio supports the delivery of social care, construction, roads, transport, environment, cor corporate education and ICT services, and it achieves annual savings of circa £14.4 million. A strategic approach ensures contracts are designed to encourage innovation, facilitate policy, support local economies and generate social value for our communities. But what does that actually mean for the people of Scotland? Well, I can honestly say for everyone in Scotland that our frameworks will have some impact on your daily life, whether it's the bin you put your waste in, the vehicle that picks it up, the salt in the roads, or the food supplied to your children at school lunch, or even the adaptions made in elderly people's homes to allow them to remain home for longer. This all comes from Scotland Excel frameworks. So over the past 13 years or so, Scotland XL has led the way in public food procurement, pushing its food portfolio to deliver value, quality produce for our councils, whilst also creating wider benefits for Scotland's economy. Our food contracts, which include milk, meats, frozen foods, bread and rolls, fruit and vegetables and groceries, are now worth a collective £82 million per year. They help to supply the products served in schools, nurseries, care homes and community centres, across the country. We also work closely with our suppliers and our local councils to ensure that our frameworks meet the requirements of all the relevant legislation, particularly the nutritional requirements for food and drink in schools, Scotland regulations 2020, setting the table, the nutritional guidance and food standards for early year and childcare providers in Scotland. And um, also we work really closely with the Soil Association to make sure that our frameworks um, have the products that um, will tick the boxes for councils going for um, Food for Life accreditation. Locally sourced produce has become an increasing priority for our councils and we've had to step up our role to make sure that public sector food contracts are more accessible to Scottish business. This also underpins the Scottish Government's drive to make sure the power of public spending is just used to boost Scotland's economy. This has become even more important in the past year well, two years or so, <laughs> um, with local supply being vital for our councils to be able to provide food to their most vulnerable residents during lockdown. We were keen to support the government's dairy action plan to include more, so to include more Scottish produce in our groceries contract for yogurt, butter, cheese and margarine, we included a secondary price list within the tender, which allowed our suppliers to offer Scottish dairy products and then given our members the choice of which items they wish to purchase. As a result of this, a range of Scottish dairy products are now available for councils to buy. And by switching their cheese to a Scottish product, local authorities have generated more than £4.2 million of business for the Scottish cheese sector through the last generation of our groceries framework and already more than £1 million on the current framework. To bring more Scottish produce onto our meats framework while still being in line with procurement regulations, we were able to specifically ask for Scotch beef and Scotch lamb by including protected geographical indication or PGI in our tender. And as a result of this, more than 75% of the produce purchased on our fresh meats framework last year was sourced from Scotland. When we developed our, our last 
generation of our frozen fruits framework, we gave suppliers the opportunity to bid on a supply only basis. And this was to create opportunities for smaller companies that didn't have the national delivery logistics in place. And as a result of this, an Aberdeenshire based fish supplier secured a place in the contract to supply Scottish haddock, which has resulted in over £3.8 million over the lifetime of the framework for this small family owned company. This approach is so successful that we've followed it in our groceries and provisions framework, and that led to the appointment of five SME manufacturers in the framework, and our new frozen foods framework also follows this same approach. Across the whole food portfolio, spending by councils and Scottish products has continued to rise. Over the past six years, it has increased year on year, and it now accounts for more than 37% of all spend for our food contracts. Not only is this approach good for Scottish business, but it's helping to create a greener Scotland by reducing our food miles. As our portfolio continues to evolve, we'll keep engaging with Scottish food producers and manufacturers, whilst continuing to support the delivery of healthy and nutritious school meals through our frameworks. We also continue to work with a number of key stakeholders across Scotland, including the Soil Association, Scotland Food and Drink, Quality Meats Scotland, APSI and Assist, and also the Supplier Development Programme. As well as looking at sourcing local or Scottish products where possible, Scotland Excel have also been working with suppliers to bring more Scottish SMEs onto our frameworks where we can. We split all of our frameworks into different local authority areas where a supplier can bid for one, any or all 32 local authority areas without being penalised. In some cases, we also split, lo split local authorities into further regional lots if we know there's, there's local suppliers there that might only be able to bid for certain parts of an authority, not the whole area. This resulted in the last generation of our milk framework having 56 geographical sublots. The team are working on the renewal of our fresh meats, cooked meats and fresh fish framework at the moment. The next generation of this framework is due to go live on in October 2022. The prior information notice is currently available in Public Contracts Scotland. If you have a look at the Scotland Excel Twitter or LinkedIn, you'll be able to find the link. And the team would be pleased to meet with any suppliers um, to discuss this opportunity. So please do get in touch with us. If you're a Scottish SME or third sector organisation interested in working with the public sector, the Supplier Development Programme can really help you. They offer expert training, support and information on how to help you win work and grow your business. Each year, the Supplier Development Programme organises hundreds of training opportunities and events throughout Scotland, and they're all listed on the website. Best thing about it, it's completely free. Just a quick slide here to de demonstrate the typical structure of our tenders. Um, we divide it into the qualification and then the technical commercial um, stage. And this provides just some general examples of the var variables we include within each of the envelope. The qualification stage is the SPD document, previously known as the ESPD. And that's where you'll find your conditions of contract, tender details, consortium, subcontractor, um, discretionary exclusions, economic financial standing, um, all that good stuff. In our technical section, that's where we'll look at your ability to service, the delivery and service, sustainability, food miles, community benefits, the living wage, ordering and invoicing. And then, of course, the commercial section where we'll look at the schedule of offer, any delivery charges, discounts, fixed price periods, um, any rebates if they're applicable. I know the public sector tendering process is a bit daunting, um, but there is lots of help available. Um, take the opportunity to, to get a prior information notice meeting with the team, speak to the supplier development programme. We've got our, our own webinar just round about the, kind of, the tender system itself. There is loads of help out there, so we can get you tender ready. Sorry, my slides have went a wee bit here while you're there. Um, sorry about that. Um, so lastly, these are the contact details for the Scotland Excel team who look after the food frameworks. Um, and the guys are all on the call today as well. So if you would like any more details on anything you've heard, please get in touch with one of us. Thank you for listening today. Sorry for the technical issues. And I hope this was um, really useful and I'll be happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Laura. That was that was really interesting. Um, particularly great to hear about the kind of innovations around splitting up the lots and, and the work that's going on to make public contracts more accessible. Um, yeah, really great to hear about that. We'll have a little bit of time for questions for the three speakers together. So I'll just hand over to Chrissy Story from the Dynamic Procurement Advisory Board, and I'll, I'll let you kick off from there, Chrissy. So yes, I am Chrissy Story, as um, Kevin said, I'm the current coordinator of the Dynamic Food um, Procurement Advisory Board. Um, I also work with Bath North East Somerset currently, um, but also was back with the team um, when they set up their, their food procurement um, model, which is now known as, as Dynamic Food Procurement. And just on, on kind of uh, a food places side of it, I actually live in Bristol, um, so very lucky to be in one of the cities, which is one of the two gold cities in, in, in the country, which is absolutely great. I was part of the procurement team when we started some of that work then as well. So a bit of background around that really, so, so yes, thank you. So just what is dynamic food procurement? I think a lot of people on this call have probably heard about it. They've probably been to webinars before, either held by um, various organizations or the DPUK stuff that's going around at the moment in the roadshows. Um, it's really a model of procurement, not a process, which is really transformative uh, um, against the conventional procurement food approaches. And I think that's probably one way of looking at it. Um, it enables SMEs to be on board at any, any one time if they fulfill relevant criteria. They look at the, it looks at the fulfillment, the consolidation, delivery, and what it's really aiming for are short and most importantly, transparent supply chains, which, you know, sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Um, but it's not proving to be as easy as it can be across food, food procurement because the food systems are so intertwined and connected. There is a website for the advisory board, which is dynamicfood.org, the bottom there, and I'll give it again at the end. But on, that, on the website, there's a, a document called Principles of Dynamic Food Procurement. So probably worth having a look at that when it kind of sets it up from various perspectives. One of the key focus of, of DFP um, is really the user centric nature of it. Quite often within procurement, one element is, or one kind of group of users or, or stakeholders are um, focused on more than the others. Procurement teams sit and do their procurement, they're very good at procurement, but don't always know the kind of what, what goes on further down the line. Um, some do some really good, some aren't quite so good, as we said. But around DFP, it's looking at the kind of the, the four lots of users. So producers, the small suppliers, the bigger suppliers, the procurers, actually the people doing the, the technical detail, logistics providers, how food actually gets to somewhere or gets from somewhere to somewhere else, and then the cooks and the chefs. And quite often it kind of shifts around on, on focus if in, in another way of doing it. So it really is that kind of user-centric way where everyone's kind of being coordinated and, and, and um, put together that it enables us at scale, or we're hoping it enables at scale. <laughs> Worked on a small point, so really are hoping it works at scale. I, what is it, worked for Bath North East Somerset Council um, called Baines, is, is the short one for that, it's too long for anything else. And the whole kind of way of looking at the summer for came, it started back in 2015, 2016, where we had a requirement to let a contract that was coming to an end. It was a joint requirement with um, Bristol and neighbouring authority to look at producing 42 slides, sorry, 42 production kitchens, serving 63 schools, so it's many, many primary and early years, serving 7,000 meals a day. At the time that was going on, we had two strategies which came very much together at the right time. One was a procurement, procurement strategy called Think Local, so encouraging us to look at local suppliers when we can. The other was a local food strategy, which had procurement at its core to support our actually mainly rural part of, of Baines in, in this element as well. On the back of a market engagement session where we had a lot of small producers in the room, we presented what we, what we were going to do, which was the, the five lot approach, um, and then realized that we needed to change direction completely. So that's what we did using the strategy, using that political will behind it from the those adoption of those, but also our supply market going, what you're, what you're proposing won't work for us. And you've just said, or you know, what you've said, so how are you gonna change that? So we did um, through a lot of supplier engagement, which is, which is great fun, I must admit. This is quite a sort of, sort of liney diagram, but it does, and if the slides get sent out later, or this one has, um, it kind of illustrates the original DFP model, which was called the Baines model and how we looked at it. We hived out um, ambient and dry goods, so things like rice, pasta, into a, into a separate contract because we wanted to focus on the fresh for this particular arrangement. That way actually went to a local wholesaler, the, the dry stuff. We had two contracts. The first one was a, with a logistics and tech management agent 
who, who produced really the, the single contact point for absolutely everything. So it went to the schools, but also went to the suppliers. And that box in kind of bluey green in the middle is really the functions they undertook for us at the time. And it's a, the next iteration actually increases on that one. So it was looking at supplier fulfillment, sort of backwards and forwards, both getting from suppliers and out again, the logistics behind it. Um, I'll come to logistics in a second. QN suppliers in terms of produce, but also kind of working with them to ensure they're on board and how they could work. And that linked to the supplier management side. Um, because we're using a, a, a dynamic purchasing system to get to product, they eventually end up running little mini competitions as well on kind of periodic basis because their procurement skills are so good after a while. But most important, it was that single contact order point, um, which held everything together. And just on the logistics side of it, for the Baines model, the organization which was Equilibrium Markets by their trading name of Fresh Range, they had delivery vans at the moment, they were running a retail operation and Baines isn't a massive area. So for this contract, the, the tech and the logistics were run together, but going forward, that's actually been separated out because of the scale of what we hope will, will go from there. But for this one, it's, it's, it was slightly different how we started it. Our second contract was a dynamic purchasing system for, for food and fresh produce, particularly around meat, poultry, fruit and veg. We were looking at other, other sides as well. We started looking at um, bakery, less than very quickly, don't ask for paperwork back from bakers when they're making mince pies in December. They don't, they don't appreciate it. Um, but that we, we never quite got to that stage for, for, for various reasons, but we focused on, the, on, the, on those fresh. Had a DPS. Um, really because we knew within our local authority area, we had a number of smaller suppliers who couldn't supply a whole contract for the whole period. Um, they could come and go when, when they wanted to, when they, when they had products. So that was great. We also had some wholesalers on there. So when we had gaps, we could use them as well, very much recognizing that we did actually, we couldn't do everything ourselves. Um, as the lady mentioned earlier, bananas and some of the fruit and things and, and tomatoes and stuff out of season, which some of the cooks were asking for, we couldn't obviously couldn't have um, when that was going on. And really a bit of reflection on kind of why it worked and all of these kind of come into it, but I'm just gonna pick on the, on the, um, the red ones to begin with. So it was an innovative procurement approach. At the time, we didn't realize just how innovative it was. Um, we had done a huge amount of supply engagement, which is crucial, but not only with producers and suppliers, big and small, it has to be said, but also a lot of tech company engagement as well. We kind of knew where we wanted to go to. So we did actually speak to some of the kind of food service guys, the kind of um, more um, that kind of intermediaries. And we decided what we wanted to do wouldn't work with somebody else. And really because a lot of their models were, were driving down costs, which is the understandable procurement, but also that would have meant our SMEs were being priced out. Um, and we, we looked at different ways of getting costs down, but it wasn't just kind of all the burden on the suppliers. So it was innovative. I mean, a lot of supplier engagement, a lot of handholding with some very small suppliers and farms um, and kept them constantly involved in what we were doing. As I mentioned, the single tech platform was critical and crucial to this. It was very transparent. The management information coming out of that was very detailed and certainly a lot more than we'd had before. We did have local suppliers going to local schools for all the reasons that you know, um, these others have said before, but also there's, there's visibility of that as well. One of our suppliers was a organic veg supplier um, within, within Baines. A while ago, that I, they, they diversified in the very nice farm shop, but there was a little play barn where a lot of children come from a local area. They could actually see where their carrots are grown or their cabernero is grown or the potatoes and stuff like that. So there was that visibility and we did have those on board um, and they worked with us to kind of look what else they could provide. One of the key things we also um, had a kind of, sort of almost a little bit of a light bulb moment about this. We required everyone to order online. Um, ordering had been done by telephone before. Um, we decided, no, if there's going to be that many supplies, they have to order online through the tech platform, which if you're a sort of, sort of kind of old longstanding school cook or chef, doesn't always go down particularly well. And that was a bit of a challenge. It has to be said that we've got in the end with a fair amount of training with them but they were given iPads to, to order on and trained how to use them. So some were fine, they, they kind of ran with it immediately because some of the older ones who'd never really used tech before, maybe relied on their son or their grandson to do it, um, usually a grandson rather than granddaughter, as we said, um, all of a sudden in this more tech, tech 
world that was coming forward in digital, that kind of was quite a good upskilling process as well. And a really quite a bit of a sideline that we weren't expecting, but it did make a difference. The gray ones are as important. Um, and I kind of touched them differently in different ways, but it was, yeah, it was a, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. It has to be said, there was a lot of hard work and then sort of um, pulling of hair, but it, that's how we got to the, the time. And then really sort of lastly, the future of dynamic food procurement. It has moved on a long way from, from the work that we did in Bath and North East Somerset Council. Um, for that was, was like, we, we need to do something, we need to meet our priorities, we need to do something different. And we were lucky at the time, you know, Baines is, is in a massive area, we could actually do something. It took a lot of work, it took a huge amount of legal input, um, but it's moved on and I think it's moved on very much for the better and kind of more expansive. And I think it's there, but we need to, we need to grasp it and we need to grasp those horns quite, quite soon to, to make it work. There's a lot of talk about it, there's a lot of people almost there. Um, we're very lucky to have the Dixon Foundation behind, behind the movement now providing some funding to try and get to move that forward as well. And I think probably a lot of you on this call have been part of the Dixon um, and the Deepak UK webinars and roadshows have been going on. But it's really that kind of new way of thinking leading to, leading to innovative, innovative solutions. This won't be the only innovation that comes around on food procurement. There will be others, but it is one, that, one that's almost ready to go on a bigger scale and that will deliver change. And me, it's kind of be part of that conversation as well. Sorry, I know I'm slightly running over Catherine, wait a second. Um, be part of that conversation as well. Within procurement, women in Baines, we didn't talk to everybody who we needed to, to begin with. Um, so the, the cooks kind of came a little bit later, but really had been engaged them to begin with. We, some, it's something we've been ironed out. So it's actually getting everyone being part of that particular conversation, not just who you think are the usual suspects. Because some people, if they want to dig their horns in, uh, so dig their heels in, can, can do that and kind of scupper stuff. But it's also getting to the influencers who may not have huge have need to it, but kind of influence as well. So yes, thank you. That was that was whistle stop tool, but slightly longer than it should be. My email address is there if anyone wants to, to email me about it. Have a look at our website. And also there's the DP UK food website, which is kind of what's happening around um, um, DFP at the moment on kind of the, the Dixon stuff and how we're trying to get that going as well. So thank you. Um, thanks so much, Chrissy. Sorry to rush you. We're trying to fit a huge amount of content into not- I know. Apologies. <laughs> Um, yes, I, we could spend so much longer on all of these topics, but trying to trying to keep roughly to time. Um, so on that note, Alan Mawson, if you were there, I will just hand over straight to you and then we will come back to questions. Yeah, uh, so morning, everybody. Apologies for that. Um, been some glitches for my side in tech, technology this morning. It's certainly nothing to do with the, the presenters. First of all, good morning. As I say, thanks to Simon and Catherine for the opportunity to present today. Um, so next slide, Catherine. Grand. So just a quick slide just to set up some introduction. Um, a speaker brief has shown uh, progressive purchasing systems, looking at them five key areas that we've got to try and cover today, increasing local and sustainable supply, more sustainable procurement systems, regional food hub, uh, support smaller producers and climate change. I'm hoping that the presentation covers most of these key areas relating to the topics for and the direct list in association with the Friesen Gallery School Meal Service. Catherine, thanks. So just a quick bit of background, as, as, as my introduction was, I'm the Facilities Manager for the Fish Gallery Council, a uh, bit of background on our, on our authority for them that, that don't know it. So first in Scotland, uh, snuggled into the southwest corner of Scotland, population of 150,000 spread across approximately two and a half thousand square miles, second largest local authority in, in Scotland, 107 schools and approximately six and a half thousand employees. Thanks. So basically, what's the Friesen Gallery got to do to support this statement? The Friesen Gallery Council support on a sustainable food system. So hopefully the presentation gives a bit of cover on that. We've been giving you a bit of tip on there. We're not actually the NG in the corner of the, the slides as we move forward. So we'll now dive into what we are trying to do to achieve that statement. Thanks, Catherine. So introducing naturally DNG. So what is natural DNG? Well, it was a it was a journey that started some eight, nine years ago when we were basically sourcing our yogurts from Dorset. And during my commute every day at that time was certainly a lot longer than it is now. We were working for home at times, but I passed one of the region's largest creameries, which was Rowan Glens, uh, snuggled into the, the, the east, the west of the region near Newton Stewart and thought, 
you know, what are we doing? We'd had issues with supplier yogurts coming up from the south. Um, and at that time, we thought, well, actually, they're sitting in our doorstep. And so the golden thread was sown for what we now see and, and have established as naturally d and and the journey began round about our local brand. Thank you. So whatever I go on list of commitments round about on that's the D&G brand is to provide a sustainable service, buy local and fresh food, source only red tractor meat, MSC certified fish, purchase only local free range eggs, deliver nutrition bill legislation, which is critical, and we'll touch a bit on that later, support climate emergency, one of our priorities for the Fish and Galloway Council, and follow food safety guidelines. These are only a snapshot or our ever growing commitments that, that we include. And naturally, DNG is far more than just food. It's all about what we do with regarding to deliver our school meal service. Thanks, Catherine. So, why our natural DNG brand, local provenance for a sustainable future? That's critical for us. So, why have we gone down the road of natural DNG? Simply because it was the right thing to do. And I think as time has moved on since that first establishment, we've proved that that is, we can see added value across many areas of local authority about what, why we should be looking at uh, a, a brand that is, that's got a sustainable future, especially relating to food. But what does the brand do? It showcases our region and our food partners, giving our customers and communities confidence in what school meal values are. And some of them values include providing high quality nutritious food, as you'd expect, help to build the local economy by supporting small, medium and large food suppliers, as we've got them in our doorstep, contribute to a more sustainable food chain, provide high quality nutritious food from sustainable sources, contribute to keeping our local money local is critical, and contribute to the Fish and Galloway's Council priority, as I say, responding to climate change or climate emergencies, we're calling it on our priorities. Thanks, Catherine. So how are we delivering naturally d and well, One of the key areas is through the unique central stores that we've got that's located directly off our main A75 on the outskirts of Dumfries. This store has a footprint of approximately 450 square metres. It operates with only nine staff, two of which are our central buying team and process all orders. It consists of two seven and a half tonne lorries, chilled and frozen lorries, one chilled stroke frozen wheel, long wheelbase van and one ambient. And all them vehicles deliver 60, approximately 60 deliveries a week across the schools in a three week cycle. All supplies come to the central stores except for our fresh fruit and veg and milk that they are direct delivery to schools just due to the, 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 the product themselves. Added value has never been more relevant when it came to this central store and co through COVID in all areas, including food, sanitizer, PPE. The operation was scaled up and the model allowed a hard-hitting local suppliers to provide essential items that we could bulk purchase and store within the facility and offer a, a huge bread, a lifeline to the local suppliers about product when they, when they were actually looking at struggling a bit supply. It was key to the emergency food programme that we delivered when we were struggling to get what we've seen as emergency food sized products, but our local suppliers came good for that and uh, the central stores allowed them for a central drop. Having the central hub is the backbone of our strategy and it provides the suppliers and local suppliers options of not requiring to consider logistics and distribution. It also receives one or two deliveries a week from breaks for, the, for our non-local suppliers, and that offers us a, a reduction of uh, cost associated with that contract. Thanks, Catherine. So just a quick map that shows the locations of our food partners and some of our very small providers that, that sits within our school, that supplies our schools and hospitality cater. And the map shows the geography of the region and the size, size of how spread it is across the region, which obviously clearly shows the challenges it would be for logistically to be for small providers to be operating. The map shows the geography of the region and challenges, uh, but also shows the logistics and that hence the reason why the central hub that we've got within central stores at, at outskirts of Freeze is key to the delivery model and actually the NG. Thank you. So we use and source some of the best food and drink in the Friesen Galloway, and here's a selection of just some of our main, main suppliers we, we, that we actually work with at the moment. Couldn't fit them all on the screen, so apologies for some that's not there. But as you can see from the Octolure eggs, as we look, we're, these are local suppliers that we've got, and we put Muller in here as well for Muller milk, milk because Muller is our local dairy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the statistics that we're led to believe is 40% of all milk, milk produced in Scotland comes from Dumfries and Galloway. And Muller, Muller milk certainly significantly support our local dairy farmers. So we see Muller as, a, as, as a certainly one of our local food partners. Like Talis McClelland, international company um, that, that we, we get our cheese from as an example. 
But one of the key areas I want to focus on in this slide was actually when we look at the likes of Express Bakeries and Rangan Glen and Crema Galloway, the, the three emblems that we've got or brands that we've got on there. The, these are local suppliers that have actually reformulated their products to meet the new nutrition bill legislation. So only this in the last fortnight, Crema Galloway have reformulated their ice cream that meets the nutrition bill legislation and it's allowed us to remove all our single use plastics that we're utilising for the compliant ice cream that we're getting from down south. I think it's actually from Ireland at the moment. So we can move to a, a four litre container that allows us to utilise that product. Raven Glen have reformulated their yogurts and they're now working through removing the single use plastic yogurts. And they're going to be giving them as in 46 litre containers as well. Express Breakers, our local, our local bakery provider has reformulated his breads to meet the new legislation. So, you know, local works really well in that aspect and they've met some of the huge challenging demands that some of the colleagues I'm sure on the call will recognise around about nutrition bill legislation that's been difficult. As it, sit, as it sits at the, mo at the moment. Don't go without just focusing on Muller as well. So Muller's been a real strong partner for us um, and they've also helped us produce uh, some videos across the, the region that's far from farm to fridge that we've done. But local certainly works and I think this proves it. And one of the key areas behind this is that it's not always more costly. Sometimes it's, it's equal or even cheaper than, than, than some of the contracts that we could get it from. Thanks, Catherine. So just to add to that, that partnership that we've got as food partners, because that's the way we look at them, is that we, we take our food partners and we build profiles up round about them and we utilise them as our food partners when we're trying to market our school meal service through our, our websites or whatever we've got. Apologies, it says Muller Wiseman, slightly out of date of that slide on there, Muller Milk now. Um, but what we do is we work with our partners to, to try and promote their business as well, specifically some of the local, local providers. And that works really well from both sides because it builds our confidence and it builds a brand, not just for the natural D&G side, but it builds a brand for the local, the local food partners that we've got as well. Pioneer Foods we put down here is an interesting one because obviously we are, we are right on the cusp of the border. Pioneer Foods are over the border and they're based in Carlisle, actually only 27 miles from our central drop in Cargan Tower, as in uh, our central stores area. And that's a huge win for us as far as Food Miles is concerned. And we've been working with Pioneer Foods for over 12 years. And, and that's a strong partnership that we've got, but works with us just based on our fundamentals of climate emergency. So um, that's one that doesn't sit within what we'd see as our, our Scottish boundaries, but it's still certainly local as far as the Fries and Gallery is concerned. Oh, and I'm just giving you a two minute warning here, okay? Just because you haven't seen the chat. One, one minute's enough, thanks. Go on, Catherine, yeah, so um, this slide's just really to show it's more about putting, this is more than just putting meal on a plate. Our values commitments impact directly on our communities. We take the brand and ethos into schools and communities, and it's key that we also have taken our, our staff onto that journey as well. And here's just a sample of the brand that we've put into all our primary, uh, sorry, all our secondary schools. Catherine, thank you. And just some stats, um, I think uh, what we're saying, we, are, we produce approximately 2 million school meals a year. Annual food cost is roughly 2.3 million and approximately 38% of our spend meets our local and Scottish commitment. I think that's, we're really heading in a positive way of putting our money where our mouth is, as far as the strap line for today is concerned. And buy, buying local can be cost effective. Thank you. So what's next? Currently reviewing naturally the D&G, including looking at our refreshed corporate catering strategy, working with new partners that we've done this year, NFU, the Fries and Galloway Sustainable Food Partnership, contribute to the National Food Drink Policy, the Good Food, Bin, the Good Food Nation Bill, and the Liver School Meal Nutrition Bill. Our strategy involves and develops and becomes more evident as natural D&G is more than just food. It's about everything that we do from procuring our food sustainably to contributing positively to tackling climate change, providing nutritious food, and taking the staff and communities on that journey. And the last line from me before we finish is, we're proud of Natural d &G. It's a brand that is local to the in Galloway and it beds itself into the heart of our communities. Catherine, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for that, Alan. That was really interesting and, and great to hear about the, the central hub that you guys have in, in d and I'm, I'm sure people will be really interested to hear about that and I also love that you worked our pun title into your presentation as well that was great um so we've got a few minutes uh for a bit of a QA, and a not nearly as long as I, I think we would all um like to have but I'll just try and go through a couple of questions each if we have time or just one each if, if not um there was a question earlier on about or there was a comment in the chat actually earlier on about the kind of competition between the retail sector 
um, and how that's sometimes seen as, as more attractive to local suppliers. So I just wondered, Laura, if you maybe wanted to comment on that and how, how we can kind of promote the public sector as a, as a route to market and the work that you guys do on that. Yeah, that's definitely something we come up against time and time again, to be honest, um, particularly around my favourite topic of Scottish chicken, um, because most of the, the chicken that is um, processed in Scotland does go into the, the major retailers. Um, at the moment, we're working with Scottish Enterprise um, to try and um, encourage, um, particularly around the chicken supply, but also around kind of plant-based proteins, um, to encourage more um, manufacturers to look at public procurement as an opportunity. Um, we do all the events like this. We try and get out as much as possible and speak to people and really highlight the opportunities. And we've also started engaging with some of our um, elected members and MSPs to get them targeting local businesses and try and get them involved and excited in the public sector process. Um, it's To me, it, it seems like a no brainer because with, with public sector, you've got more of a guarantee around payment and things like that. So, um, but it, it is a big job and it's a big challenge and it's something that we all really just need to pull together on. Yeah, definitely. There's there's lots of support out there for people who want to get into the public sector. So, yeah, definitely work to be done, but lots of great stuff happening. Um, there's a question um, in the chat, um, probably for you, Alan, about um, whether you've noticed um, kind of a knock on effect in, in production in Dumfries and Galloway because of the support that the council has obviously offered to, to local kind of growers and producers have you seen a kind of knock-on effect on on the producers in your area yeah i haven't had any direct email as far as the economy is concerned I, i'm guessing you're, you're ch chatting on that the chat on that catherine yeah i mean i, I guess from express the, the smaller supply our express breaks is a good example we know that we're, we're that they've had to bring in additional drivers uh, sorry, bakers and stuff into the express bakeries for the volume that we gave them, especially with the reformulation of the bread products that they've had to undertake. Um, so, so certainly what we've got on that is, is we, we've seen some growth within workforce, the suppliers, as far as produce is concerned. Um, what I would say was when we're speaking to Rowan Glen at the moment, the, the volume that we've got on there and the reformulation of the yogurts has been success, successful for them. Because my understanding is they've also picked up some national contract on that as well. So, so there is a knock-on effect to the, lo the local economy. And as I say, when we're putting in somewhere in the region, at least I think it's about half a million, half a million pounds is made to Friesen Galloway out of that two, about 2.3 million spend. Then it's it's significant as far as building into that that pound pound for pound into the, into the local economy, but no direct stats that would tell us what their numbers look like, thanks. Yes, it's really hard to quantify that kind of thing, but it sounds like anecdotally, at least, you're, you're definitely seeing that on the ground. Yeah. Um, so there was another question. Um, I'll just say here and now that we're probably not going to have time for all of these questions because we're really tight for time, but the speakers hopefully will be able to interact with some of your questions in the chat. Um, probably got time for one or two more. If anyone wants to put their hand up and, and come on and articulate their question themselves, please feel free. There's a raise your hand button on Zoom. But there was one that I noticed uh, a comment about the kind of the resource to be able to manage and implement a dynamic purchasing system. Uh, Chrissy, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how kind of administratively burdensome it was or, or perhaps not and, and any advice you had on that. Well, is that, yes, that, that's fine. So I think to begin with, because it was so new, it, it did take a long time and it did take a lot. There was, uh, there was three or three of us in our procurement team working on it at any one time. Um, so my South African officer and the head of procurement and obviously a legal team, which we used external from that. Once it was actually up and running, the mini competitions did take quite a, quite a sort of, that was quite a sort of procurement burden on that one. And we were quite lucky that the, the agent we used, tech agent, Fresh Range, they picked it up quite quickly and they ended up running those mini competitions. So we kind of took that out of, of, of what we were doing because they could probably, they, they could automate it better than we could. Let's put it that way. Their systems are better than quite a lot of public sector systems and local authority ones. But yeah, I mean, it, to begin with that, that kind of the, the, the mini comp type stuff was quite burdensome. And also getting suppliers on board and kind of keeping them engaged and kind of making them, getting them to, to be engaged, actually getting all that information to begin with. Um, was quite 
yeah, yeah, a lot of them are farmers, and they're not, it's not it's not their first kind of port of call to do that do this type of thing. But again, once um, the tech agent was kind of appointed and they started working, they they also took up some of that work as well. So they had a team behind them, and we, we worked quite closely. So it was a bit of a mix of both. And one of the the reasons why we went with the the agent we did is that they had a fair amount of knowledge of, of local suppliers to begin with. So they're all, they're already working with them to kind of help them sort of get on board on an electronic platform. But yeah, it wasn't simple to begin with, but it because as it's becoming more and more refined, um, it should be it should be less. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's that's interesting to know. Um, does anyone want to come on come on screen and ask one more question? Um, I've slightly fallen behind in the chat, um, so I'm conscious I might be missing a few questions. But if not, we'll we'll go to the break. I'll, I'll leave. Just a moment, silence to see if anyone wants to come on. Okay. I did try and answer all the ones that were directed at me. Yeah, I think so. I, I've seen people kind of answering them, which is great. Um, I think Ruth would like to come in, Ruth West Watson. Hello, uh, this is really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, my question is really directed at trying to maximize awareness about. Uh, in communities about the fantastic work that's being done already in some areas and the work that could or should be done in areas that aren't yet doing it. So my question in the chat was, was what is being done to put information out there ahead of the council election? So this becomes a live issue that, that people are aware of. So that in those areas where, where good practice is being followed in the Food for Life Serve Care Scheme, for example, is being, is being implemented, people know to appreciate it so it's maintained or improved upon and in those areas like where I live in Tayside where there's a big fat zero happening uh, we can make it a live issue and, and councillors become more aware about it so what, what is being done so that we can the punters can amplify the message yeah um good and tricky question um i mean i think part of why we wanted to host this event was to shine a light on some of the great stuff that is happening in the run-up to the elections um, and we will be trying to share the recording widely with uh prospective and uh, elected elected members when they uh come into place um I don't, does anyone else want to come in on that is anyone engaging um on the panel uh, with, I guess there's um, certain restrictions on, on on our speakers around the period of period. But Simon, do you want to come in? I think I just added that what we do know coming around the corner, irrespective of what happens really at the at the elections, is the fact that there will be um, an onus on on Scotland to have a national food plan and also for us to have local and regional food plans. And I think as part of that, the role of food partnerships, but also that 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 way of bringing producers and consumers and food economy and everything back to, together in order to look at how we, we work on this on a, on a sort of a more joined up approach and a system based approach will be will be actually key to delivering on these food plans to, to us to have the food system that we want to see in Scotland. And so I think actually naturally over time as things are changing now, and um, we're already seeing that, that, that this will actually become something that's very, very, very key and very important. And so that I think the work will naturally follow on from that. Um, and I think and I think that whole movement, that good food movement coming from the ground as well as top down from, from government and local authorities will be key to that. So um, I'm quite encouraged that we're going to see a lot of change over the next few years. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a, a huge and, and interesting question and, and I'm happy to pick that up with you later if that would be helpful, Ruth. Um, but I think we will go to our break now just because I'm conscious it's a super intense morning and we don't want to cut into that time too much. Um, so massive thank you to our three speakers there. That was hugely interesting, so much information, so much best practice. Um, we're going to go to a short break. We're going into our breakout rooms when we come back. So I would ask that everyone be back by four minutes past 11, just to make sure that um, you don't miss the instructions. Okay, can you see those okay, Chris? That's great, thanks, Catherine. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm joining you from a rather dreech Edinburgh this morning. Um, so my name is Chris Ross, and I am the operations manager for catering across the city of Edinburgh Council. Um, but today I'm joining you with my Assist FM hat on. And for those who don't know, 
Um, anything about assist. Assist are the body that is the voice really for all local authorities across Scotland um, for catering provision, uh, janitorial, cleaning and all FM services. So we really try and speak on behalf of all local authorities to policy makers, links to suppliers, um, links with the likes of Food for Life, etc. So we're really pleased to be here today to, to tell you about the case for good school food um, and some of the great work that already goes on across the um, local council estate. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview today of uh, universal free school meals um, and going forward I will uh, refer to it as universal provision, um, we just think it's a, a nicer term, um, and talk about the case for good school food um, of, of which the discussion paper I will enclose in a link after this uh, presentation. If anybody wants to have a read of it. Thanks, Catherine. So, um, a bit of background. Um, across all local authorities, we serve around about 250,000 meals every day, um, and that's increasing day on day um, and increasing as a result of universal free school meal expansion. And um, there's around 2,500 schools across uh, Scotland and 32 local authorities that are represented. So Scotland have been providing free school meals um, from, uh, for P1 to 3 uh, from January 2015. Um, and that was a significant milestone for Scotland um, and the provision of meals. Um, this, along with the government's 1140, which is the early years feeding expansion, um, sees a continued growth in the school meals service. Um, local authorities see the benefits of um, the free school meal program um, from 2015. We're now in year seven. Um, and certainly what you can see is the good habits that were established um, in, in early years and, and through the primary stages have, have moved up through the school years. Um, P4 Universal Provision was launched in August 2021, so relatively recently. Um, and there was a significantly high uptake um, across all local authorities, uh, around anywhere between 80 to 90% in some local authorities. Um, the average, and we've got to go back to 2019 figures because they're probably the most reliable at the moment because of COVID. Um, the average uptake across all Scottish local authorities is, is around about 79% for P1 to 3s, um, and around about 55% for um, all uh, both paid and free meals across Scotland. So there's still a lot more work to be done. And this varies by uh, local authority to local authority. Um, going into January 2022, uh, we launched uh, P5 free school meals across all local authorities. And now all local authorities are planning for P6 and P7. Um, dates to be confirmed. Um, and there's talks about expanding that through to um, high schools and beyond. Um, special schools uh, have also been covered through the Universal Programme. Um, as the economic climate continues um, to become more volatile, I think we can all see that out there. Local authority caterers are challenged. However, the service that we provide is becoming more and more vital to those who um, utilise our service. And the universal provision is a, a welcome approach um, from all local authorities involved in the, in the programme. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. So the case for good school food. Um, so this came about really um, in 2021, um, and it was set up as a working group um, through a number of key collaborators, such as Nourish, the Food Foundation, Assist, Food for Life, Scotland Excel, and, and many more partners. Um, and really the, the purpose of this discussion paper um, is to look at recommendations, opportunities, and benefits for the Universal Provision Programme um, for not just our learners in schools, but for the economy in Scotland more widely um, and the communities in which we serve. Um, and, and really the aim is to look at some key topics that I'm going to talk about in brief detail here today um, about investment in services, investment in the local economy um, and how that contributes to Scotland's wider goals. Thanks, Catherine. 
So I'm going to talk through the, the six key aims and objectives and outcomes very, very briefly. And um, there's so much detail, but I'm trying to keep it as, as succinct as I possibly can. Um, so the first key aim was that the universal programme um, contributes to the local economy. And um, that's enabling suppliers and local producers and into the public sector food and balancing the needs of um, large volumes. So uh, many, uh, you've heard from many local authorities today and, and those in procurement, for example, Laura from Scotland Excel, about the need to balance um, local and sustainable produce with the availability of supply, large volume and tight specifications that local authorities require. Now that's no easy task, but we hope through the universal programme that that will expand the spend in Scottish and local and sustainable supply. We work with organisations such as Scotland Excel, the Public Sector Food Forum in Scotland, to really prioritise um, our Scottish spend uh, across all local authorities. And you've heard from Alan today some great examples, and there's many, many more great examples of local authorities who work incredibly closely with their suppliers, producers, to deliver an exceptional service every day and to use as much local and sustainable produce as possible. So the second key aim was around the whole school approach. And this is something that's been spoken about um, for many years. And it's not an easy thing to achieve, but it's, it's getting the emphasis on that it's not just the catering provider who is responsible for, you know, understanding food and education and nutrition throughout the life of, of children in primary school, going up into, into secondary school. And it's, it's that thinking beyond the school gate and across the school day that we want to get across through this universal provision. Um, and this, this is, you know, this can vary between local authorities and their connections with, for example, education colleagues or local providers or communities in which they serve. So the, the, the second key aim is really how do we extend that message of good food, good nutrition that they're getting in their school lunch across the whole school day. And hopefully that's carried across to beyond the school day when they're at home. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so the third key aim um, is round about investment. So that's investment in our service, investment in the community in which we serve, and investment in the local economy. So how do we serve that substantially increased volume of meals across our schools every day? You know, for, for many schools, we're seeing a double of numbers uh, going through uh, and having a school lunch. So how do we ensure that we've got the infrastructure, the services, the staffing, um, to serve those meals. And, and there's many benefits behind that. Obviously, there's the local economy contributing to uh, through our spend, but there's also investment in local jobs for, for local people um, and um, the appropriateness of the budgets that we've got to manage our services. So it's really an opportunity to invest in the longer term delivery of catering services across Scotland and local authorities across Scotland who are all doing a tremendous job every day um, to generate a huge amount of, of meals. Fourth key objective um, is really uh, similar to the whole school approach, but it's placing the voice of communities and families at the heart of this universal provision. So it's making sure that we listen to our audience as effectively as possible. Now, again, no easy chat task. When you look at a lot of local authorities, they work across very diverse, um, backgrounds. So, you know, what works in one half of the country may differ to another half of the country. So there's no one set approach, but it's how do we approach it in a local level um, as, well as, as well as delivering the universal provision as, as best as possible. So it's a, it's a fine balancing act for us is how do we, how do we balance what works in, in one school with what may not work in another school? And how do we communicate with stakeholders? So a lot of local authorities go to great lengths to engage with parents, with teachers, with the community in the serve. And that could be through surveys, that could be through uh, menu flyers, leaflets, et cetera. And one of the things that, that we always struggle with is that the parental perception can sometimes be difficult to overcome. You know, when we ask our parents in Edinburgh, 
what do you think of the school meal service? They draw it back to when they were a child and they were at school. And it's how do we promote how far the service has come over the years? Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, and um, I've, I've incorporated uh, the fifth and sixth aim and outcome together um, just for the sake of time. But it's about inclusion. And that's inclusion about in the community and charitable partners um, and developing measures of, uh, developing methods, sorry, of measuring the impact that the school meal service has and the universal provision has. So, you know, it's, it's a great initiative and all local authorities are welcoming you know, universal provision across our estate. However, how do we measure, how do we, how do we gain that tangible impact on what our service has contributed to A, to the economy um, and B, to the community that they serve? And that's really crucial to be able to demonstrate that to other parts of uh, other devolved nations across the UK, is how do we prove that what we're doing, and we all believe this is a, is a wonderful initiative, but how do we prove that to um, other nations who may be interested and are following this keenly. So the, the, good, the good food bill is, is really, you know, it's, it's really critical. It's a great piece of work that's been pulled together across many stakeholders. I would urge anybody who hasn't had a chance to read it, please do. Um, again, we'll circulate the link to make sure everybody can have a read through of it. Um, but just uh, the last uh, slide, I think, is a summary of the key themes around about investment and consistent and equitable provision. So how do we ensure that the universal provision doesn't impact on those who need the provision most of all? Um, a great meal and a great environment. So that's talking about all catering providers want to provide the best service they possibly can. But we also need to look at investment in dining halls and schools to make sure that when they're having that meal, it's the, it's the, you know, the highlight of the school day, really. Then supporting the local economy. So that's through local job creation, local supply, um, contrib contributing to wider health and nutrition goals. So again, that's going back to, to tracking and measuring the impact of this. Um, and finally, um, a community and school-led approach to delivery, which as I mentioned, isn't the easiest thing to achieve, but when it works well, it's, it's incredibly powerful. So that is in a nutshell from me, um, where we are at the moment. I'd like to thank you all for your time today um, and welcome any questions. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah, I think you really covered how hugely complex and multifaceted delivering a comprehensive school meal service uh, really is if we're going to utilize the huge benefits that, that can come from that. Um, I'm just having a little look at the chat just now and I'm not seeing loads of questions but if anyone wants to come in here um, and just uh, pop your hand up or pop your video on and ask lightly questions. In this, I think. Sorry? I'm going to get off lightly in this. Yeah, perhaps. We don't actually have loads of time, so um, that's why I don't want to spend ages um, making sure I haven't missed too much in the chat. But um, yeah, I guess maybe I'll just do a really... Oh, here we go. Um, Kate, would you like to come in? Uh, yeah, I, I was just really, really interested. And I suppose, uh, yeah, I'm really keen to share this with other councils, I suppose. Have you, have you done that? Have you got time for that? Because obviously it's it's been a very useful and yeah, I think a lot of this has to come through the councils. So I just wondered where they were with that. Yeah, um, so assist represents all local authorities, so all 32 councils. And really the, the goal of assist is to share best practice and to celebrate um, one thing that we sometimes all are a bit nervous about in local authorities is, is saying when we do things well, because there is a lot of criticism um, in, in the school meal service. But ASSIST really, and the goal for ASSIST going forward is to promote the good work that local authorities do much better, because every local authority will be working on schemes and initiatives to deliver the, the best possible service to pupils. And it's how do we make sure everybody knows about it? So it's, it's a great point, uh, you know, and it's something that we need to take on board is how do we share the success a lot better? 
Yeah, I think that's that's really crucial, isn't it? Um, I, think... I think maybe one thing is to share this recording. It would be really good. I will send it to Angus Council people anyway, just in case. Yes, definitely. We will be circulated. We're going to put it on our YouTube channel and we will then circulate the recording uh, to everyone who's signed up and, and please do share it widely um, because, yeah, it's it's uh, really important to have this opportunity to share best practice. And and we have been saying whilst we're in the Purda period, this is not a political event. We do want to raise the profile of this issue in, in a non-political way. Um, but I think that is coming to the end of our time in the breakout room. Sorry, that was so quick, but I will see you guys back in the main room. And I apologise, there wasn't loads of time for questions. I mean, um, so I don't have any uh, PowerPoint or anything, so you'll just have to look at my face. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to talk this morning. Um, so I titled my session, The Value of Food for Health and Wellbeing. Um, which perhaps seems a little unrelated to procurement, especially some of the more technical presentations we've heard so far this morning. But hopefully over the course of the next 10 minutes, I'll show you why this kind of shift in thinking towards food is really vital to this whole process and whole discussion. So we're talking about food as this investment rather than a cost and why that's so vital in procuring healthy, nutritious and sustainable food. Um, so just a bit of background context. So I work for Food Train Scotland. Um, many of you are probably familiar with our work, but we work to tackle older adults um, malnutrition and food insecurity and around the barriers to accessing food. Um, so Food Chain was started uh, by older people for older people in 1995 um, as lots of people saw the challenges their peers received to access food, whether that's like physical access challenges, being unable to carry or shopping, etc. Um, and Food Chain since expanded across Scotland, so we cover 12 local authority areas um, with our branches and we have this one-to-one -one service now across all of mainland Scotland. Um, and also at Eat Well Age, your project, which is what I work on. So we work to tackle malnutrition and food insecurity at a more national level. Um, so although my expertise on this topic is pretty related to older people, and I am going to draw on older people as an example, hopefully lots of this knowledge is applicable to whatever area of work you work on. And I'm interested to hear that in the discussion. Um, so just to clarify, when I talk about malnutrition, I'm talking about it as undernutrition, I'm talking about the wider dimensions of food insecurity. So I'm not just talking about food insecurity as a financial thing. I'm recognizing the social importance of food, the well-being importance of food. Um, so a really key challenge around older adults, health and well-being is malnutrition. So we know that one in 10 older adults um, are at risk of or are suffering from malnutrition in Scotland. And actually our prevalence data suggests that that figure could be higher at nearly 17%. Um, so that's a crazy statistic especially when we know that malnutrition is preventable. Um, and that's clearly where this whole conversation today comes in. Um, we know that access to food support services are a big part and a large part of this preventable element to um, preventing malnutrition, especially as community investment in food. Um, so in 2015, um, Scottish government hosted a malnutrition summit, which some of you may have attended. Um, and actually, which led to the development of Eat Well, Age Well as a project, because it, it, they realised how important um, tackling this was. And there was lots of discussion at this summit around children's food and older people. Those were the two main social groups. Um, and you can have a look online, there's like minutes available and the recommendations that were discussed at that meeting. Um, and I'm not putting down the great work that's happening in relation to school food in Scotland. I think it's absolutely amazing what's happened, especially in the past two years. The response has been absolutely incredible. But at the same time, seeing this ramping up of support for um, young people, at the same time, we've seen a reduction in support for older people, especially for those people living at home. So we've seen a reduction in services um, that maybe you all assume still exist to support older people. So things like Meals on Wheels, things like local authority lunch clubs has been a big stripping back of lots of those services, which has been exacerbated by COVID, but it's not, COVID isn't the main factor in this uh, conversation. So I suppose, well, why does that link back to procurement? Um, and I think that's important to recognize in this context, important to recognize because we can't look at changing and shifting a procurement process if the services don't even exist to start with. Um, and it's important to recognize that some systems don't even exist. So we can't shift and change and alter this process um, 
without thinking about and shifting our knowledge and assumptions about what falls into public food or what the public purse is spending um, money on. Um, so just give one example. Um, in Dundee, I was in Dundee a few weeks ago um, and I was talking to one of our branch staff and she said that one man who was reliant on meals and meals, bearing in mind in the past these would have been local authority run, um, now he just gets a sandwich um, every day, a cold sandwich, and just sits there and has to eat that. Um, so I think really what I'm trying to hopefully show in bringing this conversation discussion into this um, discussion this morning is how do we value food, especially for the most vulnerable, so those who are most at risk of malnutrition, those who are most at risk of falls, or the wider impacts such as social isolation and loneliness. So how we as a society value food and how we as a society value everyone, and that is a large part of this procurement conversation. Um, so the Good Food Nation bill um, talks about everyone having pride and pleasure from their food experience. Um, and it comes back to that, I think, um, how we value food and value food as this investment and the preventative role that food can have, um, that we all need food to survive, but also to thrive. And currently the processes that exist don't value that. Um, so you might have seen a photo if you came to a cross-party group um, a few weeks ago that Jane Jones shared, who's chair of Assist FM. And it was a really uh, great photo of um, children in Argyll and Butte uh, sharing a meal at school. And you could clearly see um, the laughter, the bright, colourful food, the animation that food had given, um, and so much more captured in that photo that food gives us, that joy, that friendship. Um, and maybe you can even feel like yourself when you were able to reunite with friends and family and have that meal that you'd been so wishing for and thinking about throughout the whole of the stricter lockdowns and restrictions. So how does this food and that physical item on the plate, how can that act in a preventative role? And I think that's really where this shift in thinking needs to come if we're looking at procurement. First of all, that the systems need to exist, but also that we see this as a a spend and we don't see it as a financial cost we see these wider um, benefits and importance um so how do we ensure that everyone gets this positive food experience and how can we channel this into these conversations um in the procurement process so um food chain has had lots of learning over the past 26 years um around how food support can positively influence older people so um we know that um, food support so in many different forms that can take whether that's like shopping support or meals on meals or lunch clubs which obviously as I said could in the past may have been um, local authority run and they are some great examples still that exist but it's not consistent across Scotland in the same way as school food um, that we know that um, if this food support service can break these negative cycles of social isolation or food insecurity or malnutrition risk or low mood or feelings of self-worth and belonging. So it's seeing that this is an investment right now. Um, so how does that relate to procurement? Um, so seeing it as more than this financial outlay that recognizing that we all need to recognize that food has this direct impact on this wider ability um, to allow everyone to experience pride and pleasure and joy and this wider systemic impact that will hit later, you know, on the environment, et cetera. Um, so we know that, um, when someone's malnourished, there's a significant increase in likelihood of hospital admission um, or there's likelihood of falls and this financial cost. So here we're talking about cost. So, for instance, that those who are malnourished are twice as likely to visit their GP or that they are three times likely to have a hospital admission or they're likely to have to stay in hospital longer than a well-nourished person. So based on a calculation by the British, British Association of the Periental and Enteral Nutrition, the cost of malnutrition to the UK health service, that's UK wide, was £23.5 billion. Pounds. And older people contribute to 52% of this. The health and social care costs are estimated to be three times greater for a malnourished patient than a non-malnourished patient. And roughly doing some kind of very rough costs, in Scotland, that could be costing, instead of seven, 768 million, could be reduced to 221 million. So reactionary model to health and thinking about health and well-being to how actually if we invest in food and see this value, um, we can um, you know, reduce the financial cost, but it's also the social cost. It's 
um, the enjoyment of food. And this is so vital in creating this happy and healthy population that we so often don't include in part of these conversations. Um, and this is really important if we're talking about older people because Scotland is aging and it's aging the fastest out of all four um, nations. So we need this shift in investment, we need this shift in attitude, and this is important to this procurement process. Um, so just recognizing that it's about better investment, it's about more investment, and it's about better investment, and that food can have a positive impact on health and well-being and harness the preventative role of food. It can break these negative cycles of food insecurity, it can break these negative cycles of malnutrition and have broader um, far-reaching effects. Um, so I believe a large part of this conversation and needs to be much greater part of this conversation is around this cultural and societal shift in how we value food. That the financial investment of food is not seen as a cost, but as an opportunity that has wider social, economic, well-being and environmental benefits. And I wanted to end this presentation with a quote from Jane Jones. Um, she gave this quote to the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee um, as part of their scrutiny in the good, into the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill just a few weeks ago. Jane said, all too often we see food as a cost to be born or a cost to be cut. We need to reframe. We need to think about it as an investment in those wider strategies and aspirations. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing about what you will have to say. Brilliant. Thank you, Tilly. And, and I think that point about seeing food as, an, as a, an investment, a cost is something that runs through so much of the work that, work that we all do. And that whole idea, when I can remember someone saying to me, well, you know, we serve food at school and it's nutritionally balanced and blah, blah, blah. But then we, need, we should get them through to their next lesson. So well, why is the meal, the food, not part of the educational system? Why is that not um, part of the lessons when we to, to talk about school, to enjoy, um, enjoy food, sorry. And, and that's been resonated with quite a few people in the, in the chat here. Um, so I'm just going to read through a few couple of the questions that have come in. Um, so Joel Evans said, um, what... So I think Tilly has illustrated well how food, as well as other sustainability issues, is linked to wider societal relationships. What social issues and relationships could we work on to bring through increased benefits from food? Um, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> <That's> a <big laughs> question. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's lots of different ways, and I think it's important to recognise that we all have our own relationship with food. So there shouldn't be this one, like, one size fits all. It's, you know, some people might want to engage in food in a certain way, or some people might be happy to eat on their own, but it's having the option to be able to have many ways to engage um, with food. And um, there's a lot of work happening around intergenerational um, opportunities. So, and this is where we could really bring this school food and older food kind of conversation together. So, um, uh, Dunbar Grammar School in Dunbar, they've done some great work on a dinner at Dunbar program where they um, the children do cooking and they prepare a meal and they learn about cooking and nutrition and then people from the old older members of the community come into the school and they share a meal together um, so I think there's just there's many different ways and it's looking at context really and the individual as to what works and um, I hope that answers your question brilliant thank you um Mads you've got a couple of questions here well and maybe you'd just like to join us and, and just and just articulate them because it'll save me reading them out and you've probably got a better voice. Hi there. Yeah, no, I actually only, yeah, I have a, a question about the costs and uh, and your, your cost calculations because I worked as a civil servant working on, among other things, public procurement when I lived in Denmark. And, and I just remember that we had such a hard time getting any traction behind these kind of arguments. We could make the argument, but then the way costs are calculated in the health department or the uh, Department of Finance doesn't really take into account kind of like the, the prevention effects of, of certain initiatives. So I was just wondering if it actually works and if it works, where does it work? Uh, is it like national policymakers? Is it local policymakers? So the kind of like the cost argument. Are you getting any traction behind that? Because I had a hard time, even though yeah. it seems such an opinion. To be honest, I don't often use the cost figure. Has am I frozen or was that me? You're you're, you're okay. Go on, please. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think in terms of financial costs, I think I saw it in your message in the chat, you said about storytelling, and I think that comes back to it more than necessarily saying the numbers. I just use those today because I think it just 
really shows the stark contrast. And that was calculated by Bacon, who are based in down south. Um, and this is likely to increase because we know that one in 10 older adults, that's the most up-to-date figure, but that could that's likely to be a lot higher. And that's based on the census, which is obviously happening again and we're aging. So that's probably a massive underestimate, in fact. But I find that um, people want to hear the stories and they want to relate to their own family. And most people have got an older person in their lives and kind of bringing it back home to that is definitely much more powerful than um, using numbers sometimes. Um, I mean, we've been sick a long time, but uh, the minister, Marie Todd, she's committed to a short life working group on malnutrition and this preventative focus. And that's I mean, a real opportunity, hopefully, um, to bring kind of this thinking um, forwards at a government level to a malnutrition strategy. But obviously, as you say, it's just linking it all together is so, tra so challenging. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. There's a, um, so um, Emma's mentioned in the chat to say, would you be able to share those figures? Because I think that they're really interesting figures to, to have on hand. And um, Abby's come in to say there's an interesting new project being piloted in Dumfries and Galloway around food for older people. Basically, local, local community projects will be resourced by the council to provide hot, healthy food locally. Which it might work, we'll see. And I think that's really interesting because I had a question with where do you see the role of the community sector? in this because obviously it played a huge part and there was so much reliance on it during the, especially the early lockdowns um, and what are you seeing now? Yeah and um, that's a good question I mean so food train started in Dumfries and Galloway so I'd be interested to find out a bit more Abby about um, that work um, well I think that's clearly that's an interesting point because I think currently the community sector is filling in the gaps where there isn't that service provision by local authority or at whatever level it's falling to the third sector and that means it's not consistent and it's sporadic across Scotland um, and I think it's great that local community initiatives are happening but ideally I'd like to work myself out of a job like I shouldn't be needing to be talking about this this should be something that just happens in the same way as We've recently had, you know, children, school food and meals like, I don't know, I think there needs to be that system at large and there's got to be national standards and so much more to it. But I do think right now the community sector are doing absolutely amazing work and um, without so many of these people, people would have simply starved to death, I think, at the end of the day, um, especially during the pandemic, like at the earlier stages. Definitely, I'd agree with that. And and having been part of one of those community organisations during the pandemic, just the, the the need that was there, and and but the amazing people that came together to do that it was, was was fantastic. But we shouldn't rely on the community sector to do this. You know, this is big government's job. You know, they should be looking out for 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 their for their, for their citizens. Okay, I'll just give um, a few more seconds to make sure we've got everyone back in the main room. Um, Apologise if anyone was cut off mid-sentence there in the other room. Um, that definitely felt very, very brief in our room, uh, but a really great session as well. So hopefully everyone found that useful and informative. Um, okay, we should should be mostly back in the main room so we will crack on as as ever we have a lot to get through um, in a short space of time um, so we're going to go into our final session now um, which we have termed it's not just about food miles uh, which we kind of um, implied earlier that we would touch on the kind of broader picture of sustainability beyond just local food because we really feel that's that's an important issue as well so I'm delighted that we're joined by Andrew Stark and Ilva Haglund uh, from RSPB Scotland and uh, Zero Waste Scotland. Um, so Andrew's going to speak followed by Ilva and then whatever time we have left, we will go to questions. So Andrew. Brilliant, thanks Catherine. And hi everyone. Uh, great to see so many people uh, still on the call and thanks for coming today uh, to what is a fascinating topic. And as Lucy said earlier, there's a ton of experts in the room, so I'm not going to pretend like I know everything. This is just to add another angle uh, to, to the discussion so far. So I'm going to um, share my screen and just get my slides up. Cool. Can everyone see that? Okay. 
Brilliant. Thumbs up from Catherine. Good stuff. Okay. So um, this quote at the top, um, why are you interested in food? Food. I thought you were a bird charity is a genuine quote <laughs> that I've had through working at the RSPB. So um, my name is Andrew Stark. I'm a land use policy officer at RSPB Scotland, and I focus on food and farming policy. So today I'm going to sort of add a nature and climate angle to the discussion uh, and show some of the problems we've got with the environmental impacts of our food system as sort of we've already been touching around the some of the intricacies of local food, for example. So to start with, uh, nature is in decline, unfortunately. The latest State of Nature report shows that one in nine species is at risk of extinction, and Scotland ranks 28th from bottom in the Biodiversity Intactness Index, which is a global analysis of how much human activity has impacted nature. Um, also, the window for climate action is closing. The latest IPCC report that came out the other week shows that the window for us to close the gap on emissions is rapidly getting shorter, and our food system is a key driver of environmental damage and land use change. So in Scotland, we've got 70% 70, 70 of land use in Scotland is dedicated to agriculture. And the way that um, our food system and the way we use our land and our seas and our natural resources has a big impact, both positive and negative for nature. So it'd be fair to say that farming and crofting are the sort of unique Scottish way of farming in, that we have and nature are, are all independent. And just finally, a quick nod, um, I added this in the very last minute, but uh, the discussion around local food that has been going on in the chat was interesting. And just a flag that my colleagues at UK level wrote this report with Sustain called The Case for Local Food, um, which is a really, uh, it's quite a Westminster focus report. So it's not um, so Scotland specific, but there's a lot of really interesting facts and figures around some of the economic benefits to local food, etc. So that's just to highlight that for, for reading afterwards. I can put the link in the chat. Uh, so my next slide. Oh, so yeah. So as I sort of said, farming has a massive impact on nature. And uh, as as the as the the bird one, I'm going to focus uh, on birds. And the reason that birds are, are sort of a quite an interesting way of of measuring how good or bad things are for nature, is that they're a way of measuring sort of broader themes of biodiversity. So this is the UK Farmland Bird Index, uh, and it shows that. Um, that the, um, the amount of birds we've had has essentially gone down for, from 1970 to 2019 by 55%. Uh, and zooming in on a few key species in Scotland here. So we've got curlew, oyster catcher, lapwing and red shank. So as you can see, um, their population numbers have declined quite significantly um, through the um, breeding bird survey, which is another survey of, of bird numbers over uh, over the years, and the reason that um, you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things wrong in the world, and you know birds are part of of that sort of bigger picture. So it might be fair to say you know, but they're just a few birds. Why they're important? But the reason being that if you, as well as the their sort of local biodiversity impacts. Uh, on their declines, the, the global population of these birds. The UK holds really significant um, bird populations and it's really important that we move to a better food system and a better way of farming that can help secure the future for these birds in the long term because that ultimately is around creating a healthy ecosystem, a stable nature uh, and climate. So um, moving on very quickly to just to say that Farming is also part of the solution, however, and although uh, agriculture ha has um, led to some of the nature declines that we've seen through, through loss of habitats and intensification and the specialization of agriculture, so that means things like more inputs and more pesticides. Um, also, there's ways that farmers are able to work with nature. And here we've got a wader scrape, which is essentially a big puddle uh, in a farmer's field, and that can provide homes for insects uh, and therefore food for birds. And here we've got some lovely um, nest eggs uh, and cattle grazing showing how, how um, animals can work side by side within farming systems. So public procurement, food and nature. Um, and I'm, I'm aware as the discussion has gone on today, there's been a lot of examples. Uh, and these are uh, the reason being I've chosen these two. These are the two that have um, well, one from a personal perspective, Locavore, um, uh, my veg box came during this um, public procurement event, in fact, which I found quite a nice fit. Um, so they are um, a um, fantastic organisation doing a lot to provide, um, uh, you know, that sort of social enterprise and network to 
um, local food systems with five shops across Scotland uh, and the Vegbox scheme I mentioned, and they recently won a dry goods tender for East Ayrshire Council. Um, and also Woodside Farm, which Lucy mentioned earlier, um, was already spoken about, but I think that's quite a nice um, example of that small sort of smaller farm system working um, in the uh, on Aaron. Um, so the, the point being that public spending on food can be a key way of addressing nature and climate emergencies uh, and supporting, uh, as Tilly said in my breakout room, that investment of food into more agroecological farming systems, but also um, shorter supply chains is, is part of that dynamic. But I think um, the, the main point being that using this money to invest in, in nature and climate through supporting local organic agroecological ways of farming um, is, is a is a really positive thing. Um, so, uh, as I said, I'm a policy officer, so uh, I, that's um, sometimes quite dry. But I think it's really important to focus on some of the um, some of the ways that we can create this change. Um, and zooming out a little bit, I'm going to talk about the Good Food Nation Bill. So this is a key piece of food legislation going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment, as has already sort of been mentioned. There's commitments to local and national food plans, which is great to see. And I think um, that will hopefully provide a really strong mechanism to build on some of the good work that's already being done across Scotland. But there's huge opportunity for much, much more. Uh, and at the moment, the bill is quite weak in some regards. It doesn't have um, strong enough language on issues around the right to food, uh, nor um, does it establish a food commission, uh, as well as um, some of the targets and measures that um, we at RSPB, and I'll come on to a second to speak about the Scottish Food Coalition, would like to see. So although the Good Food Nation Bill is here, it's fantastic. There's some more work to be done to improve that. Uh, and there's also the, that opportunity to mainstream nature-friendly public procurement and some of the things we've spoken about um, already. Um, what we don't want to do is create niche markets where some people are able to access these, um, access lovely organic food and other people can't. It needs to be across the piece. So that's, I think, where public procurement can be a, a key driver of that sort of growth of that um, way of having a, a sort of alternative food system. Uh, and um, linking outside the Good Food Nation Bill quickly, there was a, um, a, an interesting discussion in the chat around the links to agricultural policy as well. And the agriculture bill is set to come forward in 2023. Uh, and there's a really key link here between the Good Food Nation Bill and the sort of food system approach. And as I sort of outlined earlier, agriculture itself um, is a key driver of, of good and bad within the food system. So what we would like to see is, is join up between agricultural policy and food policy. Uh, and it's key to make sure that the supply can meet demand. We know that um, the demand for organics is growing up quite significantly, and it's important that there's enough organic food being produced to, to sort of meet that demand. And we don't have to uh, import from, from all over the world and we're able to create that sort of long, stroke, long, strong, local, strong, resilient food system that we'd all like to see. So in the last couple of slides, I'm just gonna briefly talk about the Scottish Food Coalition, which I have the privilege to help coordinate. Sorry, my phone's dinging. So um, I'm gonna hopefully ignore it and um, it won't ding again, let's hope. Um, so the Scottish Food Coalition uh, and RSPB here is a member alongside, I've seen a few familiar faces in the chat, which is great. Um, we are a coalition of nearly 50 organizations working for food system transformation in Scotland. And at the moment, the Good Food Nation Bill is a key part of of that work. Um, there'll be um, opportunities to, to, to get involved with the bill and I'm going to put my email, at, uh, email address at the end there to um, um, offer an invitation if anyone would like to help um, get involved in the campaign that we'll be running around the bill. We'll be having an event outside Parliament uh, late, later in April and that'll be a key opportunity for us to, to talk about some of those changes to our food system. So. Um, just to, my take home message would be that public spending on food can be a key way of addressing the nature and climate emergencies. Uh, and there's the website for the Food Coalition um, that you can sign up to our newsletter. And in the next one that will be coming out later this month, there'll be lots of opportunities to get involved in the campaign and to help move to um, a food system that supports nature, more nature friendly um, public procurement systems. So that is my email address as well if anybody would like to get in touch and I'll pop it in the chat. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. That was um, really interesting and, and, and looking forward to maybe diving into a couple of those things a bit more in the Q&A. Um, but we'll just hand straight over to Ilva if, if you're ready to go. Thank you very much. Yes, I am. Let me just share my screen. So hopefully that's all visible to everyone. Um, Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me to be part of today's session. So at, uh, as the last of the speakers, my subject is inevitably also the end of the line, the waste at the end. So in the next 10 minutes, I'll set out why this, if you like, the least glamorous and sometimes forgotten aspect of the food system has such a massive impact and how public procurement has the power and the potential to be a real game changer for reducing food waste and also reducing then our impact on the planet as part of addressing the climate emergency. So for, first of all, for those of you who don't know, Zero Waste Scotland is a publicly funded organization that exists to create a society where resources are valued and nothing is wasted. And our goal is to help Scotland realize the economic, environmental and social benefits of making the best use of the world's nat uh, natural resources. So you can see the, the themes of our work here and our topic today relates both to uh, resource efficiency and the circular economy, as we shall see. So why then is this a priority for us and why is it an important consideration as part of this topic? Um, well, first of all, food waste, quite simply, is a massive strain on the food system, it has an enormous impact on the environment, and it contributes significantly to climate change. Um, as you can see on this slide, globally, a third of all the food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted every year to the value of around $1 trillion, and around 30% of the world's agricultural area is used every year to produce food waste, food that is then wasted or lost. Um, and then, you know, why is this so bad for the environment? Well, when we waste it, we also waste energy and resources and the associated carbon emissions that went into growing, harvesting, transporting, processing, and preparing food. And then to make matters even worse, if we don't recycle what waste we, that can't be avoided at the end ends up going into landfill, it very soon gives off very harmful greenhouse gases um, or greenhouse gas called methane, which has a big effect on climate change. And as you can see here, um, food waste is up there with the top greenhouse gas emitters. It's estimated that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So as you can see, food waste is, or should be, big news. So what does this all mean for Scotland then? Well, our estimate is that 1 million tonnes of food waste is produced in Scotland every year, and the impact is significant. The CO2 um, equivalent impact of the total Scottish food waste is 3.7 million tonnes. And what this means is if we could stop it, it would be the equivalent of removing nearly 2 million cars of our roads. It's very carbon intensive, despite making up only 5% of all types of waste produced in Scotland by weight. Food waste is responsible for 25% of carbon emissions from waste. So that's why the Scottish Government published this document in 2019, the Food Waste Reduction Action Plan, to set out a number of measures to reduce food waste and working towards a target of a reduction by a third by 2025. And one of the key themes in that plan is the potential for the public sector to lead the way and to develop good practice and show others what's possible. So how then can this be done? Um, well, first of all, in order to take action, you've got to know what you're dealing with. So there is a need for monitoring of how much food waste is produced and why. Um, and this will be even more important with the introduction of universal free school meal as free school meals, as there is a, a risk of significant increase there in food waste. So the pie chart on the left of this slide shows all food waste in Scotland annually, and the bit that says other um, estimates that 14% is where the public sector is included. Um, the reality, though, is that there is a significant data gap here, 
Uh, at the moment, public sector bodies are required to report on their greenhouse gas emissions, and this includes emissions from waste, but consistent and more detailed monitoring would allow targeted action to understand the problem at each stage of the supply chain. And that will show opportunities for reduction and, of course, also cost savings as a result as well. So the real power of public procurement is that just like sustainable procurement can have a positive impact on farming and production activities, it can also positively impact on food waste in the whole supply chain by specifying a reduction in food waste to reduce environmental impact. It can set high standards, it can ask for evidence. So I want to give you a very small example of positive practical action in this area um, that I'm involved in. I'm working with four primary schools within Glasgow City Council, where the schools are weighing the plate waste, so what's left at the end of the meal in the dining halls at lunchtime for a full menu cycle, and then delivering learner-led campaigns and interventions based on their insights from this measurement. So this is a, a really early stage of so still measuring, but some anecdotal findings suggest that things like food quality, inflexibility in portions, staff pressures, timings and food choices are some of the things that impact on food waste. And there is also clear that, just as, as Chris said in his breakout session, that there's a real desire from staff and pupils for an approach to school food procurement that includes an element of participation to help inform practices. So input from the end users, the kids themselves in this case, could support development of procurement policy here. So while making sure that there is minimal food waste in the first place will have the biggest environmental impact. It's sometimes difficult to do and considering the quantities of food involved in public procurement, there will of course be leftovers. Um, so the fact is that food procured in the public sector is um, a huge economic and nutritional asset. So we need to consider all the opportunities within a circular economy where we don't just make this food and throw away what's not used in the first instance, but we reuse, we recycle, we recover as much as possible a whole, along the whole supply chain and in that order as well. So providing food for animal feed, for example, can positively contribute to the local economy, the local community uh, and the environment. And for food with no other use, we need to make sure it will be properly recycled in order to avoid those landfill emissions that we mentioned before. But before this, though, we should look to redistribute food to people. So right now, redistribution of leftover or surplus food within the public sector is quite limited. Um, so how can we make sure that what's left is fed back safely into a system that can use it where the community can benefit? I think we have an opportunity here to think about this food as a community asset that can benefit many and varied groups. And there are many innovative solutions um, for publicly procured food from other countries that's going to redistribution. Um, and I just wanted to include one uh, within our talk today. And you may have heard of um, the work on food waste by the city of Milan, because they won the Earthshot Prize last year around waste reduction. So what they did is they coordinated, um, set up food hubs uh, within the city that now have, I think, five on the go. Um, and basically the council donated the space for stocking and redistributing surplus food. Um, so surplus food is picked up in the, in the morning from supermarkets and businesses and from canteens in the afternoon. Businesses who are taking part in the initiative are given a 20% tax reduction on their waste tax and that in the second year that goes up to 50%. And what this is is basically payments for their waste uplift, the, you know, the, pay, the waste management that's the way it's paid there. So you can see the kind of basic outline of the model there. They're also doing a lot of other things. They're focusing a lot of the attention on the areas of the food system that they have direct control over. So school canteens are a big part of that. 
For example, in order to prevent fruit waste at the end of each lunch, they've started a program where children receive fruit as a morning snack instead of the end of the meals. This program involved 17,000 children in 2018. It prevented 17% of all the food waste in the schools where the program was active. Other things as well, like um, they distributed, they gave the children reusable doggy bags so they could take any non-perishable leftovers home. So loads of different examples there of what they're doing as part of kind of council citywide led approach. Uh, and you know, that we could consider too. So to summarize, public procurement has a huge potential. It has power to reduce food waste and take a real action on climate change. To make this happen, we must stop treating food waste as something unavoidable and start making the most of publicly procured food. Uh, there's an opportunity here for improved inclusion of waste reduction and circular economy principles for sure, and monitoring practices, which could be a major game changer. So if you're not already, if you do one thing, is to start measure food waste now, and there are resources on the Zero Waste Scotland website to help you. Um, from our point of view, Zero Waste Scotland would really like to explore linking up with others working on sustainable public procurement because we need a joined up cross-cutting approach to avoid unintended consequences from action in one policy area on another. And together we need to ensure that we provide support to procurement professionals to help them fulfil their potential public procurement acting for a sustainable food system along the whole ch supply chain. So that's it. Thank you very much and I uh, look forward to hearing any questions. Thanks so much, Elva. That was um, really interesting. I love the idea of um, food waste as a community asset and also the, the doggy bags at the school meals. Um, that would be, be great if we could get that rolled out in, in more areas. Um, so we've got uh, a few questions in the chat. Um, uh, Mark Stein is asking um, whether Scotland has any plans to follow the example of Sweden and get local authorities to publish the, their statistics on, on school food waste uh, broken down into different categories or on, on food waste rather. Um, I think you, you slightly touched on, on the kind of reporting obligations, but would you, could you expand on that a little bit more? Um, it's something that is discussed at the moment um, as part of work, which is around a, a kind of waste route map for Scotland. So certainly it's something that would change the picture completely, um, but there is nothing, there's nothing concrete just now, but it's part of the discussions. And of course, we welcome anyone, you know, wanting to share their food, food waste data with us at any time. Great. Um, there's also um, a question um, a little bit earlier on about whether there's actually enough support for farmers and producers to transition to more sustainable practices. Um, and, and Simon's commented a little bit on, on that in the chat, but Andrew, I wondered if you wanted to come in on that as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, um, we at RSPB work uh, alongside the Nature Friendly Farming Network, which I should give a shout out to, which is a membership organisation of nature friendly farmers, uh, and they um, have a vision for agriculture where uh, nature and agriculture are co you know, coexist. Uh, and I think the look, I was looking at their um, membership stats, which have just the, the lines like that. So I think there's, there's growing demand for, um, as I sort of said in my slides, um, growing, you know, consumer interest in organic foods etc but I do think that question is really good because yeah it's how we can we being policy uh, and government um, or the government sorry um, help support that transition uh, and make sure it's a just, just transition where you know farmers and crofters aren't left behind so what we would like to see as part of that is to to reform the agricultural subsidy system so that we have more money targeted towards um, both those sort of more conservation focused activities like I spoke about, but also to, to facilitate that transition. Um, so um, there, there, there are, there are um, already funding schemes for organic transition, um, but you know, we would like to see that expanded, for example. So yeah, it's, it's um, how, um, 
how the farmers and crofters can be supported to, to, to do that, because I suppose whatever gov government commitments they make then have to be carried out as well. So you don't want farmers to, to be left behind. Yeah, definitely. It's so important. Um, I think Barbara had her hand up. So if you had a question, you could come in here. Maybe, maybe she's... Yeah, I'm coming in. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to. Uh, I've been um, posting in the chat, but I've been posting to um, an individual by mistake. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I just really wanted to ask the question how can we get consumers to accept uh, not getting everything they want when they shop? And I'm asking this question. One of my uh, roles is I'm uh, on the National Members Council for the co op. And um, as we all know, there's been shortages in the supermarkets over several years, over the last two years. And I can tell you, people get so upset if they go into the supermarket and they can't get, you know, and I'm not talking about never get what they need, but today they can't get milk because actually it's sold out. And um, I, I, was, I was quoting, I was at um, a Scottish Fair Trade Forum uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago, and there was a speaker there who was speaking about how food's been marketed. And he said that the, the, it's about 50 years ago, the um, mantra for marketing was the purpose of marketing is not to sell what you can make, but to make what you can sell. And I just think, um, you know, we, we're all speaking here and everything that I've heard is absolutely wonderful but you know consumer demand drives everything and people just get so upset if they go to the supermarket and they want broccoli and there isn't any you know they're not they're not in that frame of mind where they go okay um well I'll have either broccoli or cabbage or perhaps I'll have some root vegetables you know they just expect to get what they want and I'm I'm wondering what what the speakers think about what we can actually do about that thank you Um, so kind of a bit of a question around, I guess, seasonality, I guess, and in, in terms of being able to access what's what's in season at Scotland when it's grown. Is that kind of what you're getting at? That's part of it. That is a part of it. But actually, it's bigger than that, because it's actually about um, the, the only way supermarkets, for instance, can reduce their waste. And we have to accept that, you know, most people buy their food from supermarkets um, is if they only bring in each day what they know they can sell. Now, at the moment, they bring right. probably 20% more than they know they can sell, and the rest of it goes to waste. Oh, OK, I'm so with you given now. Away. I mean, it doesn't actually go to waste anymore because it's given away. And, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But actually, people need to not necessarily expect to get everything they need, you know, in, in the supermarket every day. They need to be able to plan ahead yeah. of it you know, it's 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 bigger than just seasonality, unfortunately. Yeah. OK. Um, Ilva, do you want to come in quickly on, on that point? Um, yeah, it's a really important point. And you're right, Barbara, of course, we've come to be you know, accustomed to um, having everything available um, all year round and at any time. And I'm, I'm, I do not have the answer to how we do it, <laughs> um, but it's about changing social norms. And, uh, and I think that takes time and investment and collaboration and, and, and looking at how we, we could do that. Um, so. Yeah, it's a it's a very difficult one because our food system has developed, you know, for many decades now in that way. Um, and how do we stop and, and make it acceptable and without people also suffering, you know, um, unintended consequences of that, you know, if they're accessing struggling to access food in the first place. So um, <clears throat> no answer, I'm afraid, but I agree that it's, a, it's a, an important point. <laughs> so, yeah. Spend a winter in Shetland, yeah, good idea. And <laughs> what we can do actually is, you know, we can we can uh, focus on skills, you know, to some as on only part, small part of the solution, but you know, skills of actually being able to think of alternatives, cook with different things, you know, that's a key part of a waste reduction as well. Definitely. Um, we've not got long left, but Simon, you've got your your hand raised. Did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to bring it back to public procurement and just sort of suggest that. Well, Barbara, I think you're making a really, really good point here, but I think in terms of how we work with this Republic of Kilman, it's about the, the ability to buy seasonal Scottish food where, where, where possible and local food. And in fact, it's those 
people in public procurement that can set the tone within the menu development. So that's one of the ways we can sort of start saying, well, actually, oh, we are going to have serve area today, or we are going to have it sweet today. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be, you know, we, we can sort of design that into it. And some of the progressive purchasing systems we talked about earlier are ways which we can do that. So just to sort of bring it back to that. Yeah, definitely. The, the public sector almost provides that really unique opportunity to normalise a better way of doing things in terms of uh, waste and seasonality and um, sustainable sourcing. Um, we are now at 11.59. So um, I'm going to wrap things up there. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get through everything in the chat. It's been really active in the chat and it's almost been hard to keep track of everything. Um, so hopefully everyone has enjoyed the event. We will be circulating the recording afterwards and a feedback survey and a chance to sign up for our mailing list. So please look out for that email um, and a massive thank you again for everyone who's attended and particularly everyone who has spoken at today's event.